I'm Dr. Sandra Hernandez, and I'm the CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. And uh, Peter Long and I, Peter from the Blue Shield Foundation, uh, really want to welcome all of you here today. Um, you know, uh, Alan, uh, in, in uh, conceiving how to frame uh, this particular uh, edition of Health Affairs, uh, really asked the question sort of what's happening in California and does it matter any place other than California? Uh, I think it's a really good question. Um, keeping in mind that there are 40 million people in California, there are 58 counties in California, there are half a million uh, new births in California. Uh, we're a state that has enormous innovation and I would argue also has an enormous commitment to continuous improvement and to learning from what has gone on in the state. And really that, uh, that spirit of health affairs, being able to take uh, peer-reviewed data, a rigorous approach to step back and really analyze uh, what's working well, uh, what might we improve, where there's some challenges, uh, is a, uh, there's very few organizations in the country that can do that. Uh, health Affairs is certainly one of them. Uh, health Affairs has been around for 40 years. CHCF has been supporting it since its inception. Uh, we think it's very important for policymakers, for people in the public sector and the private sector, uh, for advocates uh, to be engaged in this conversation, looking at data, what's worked, what we, where we've done some amazing things. And uh, really, we couldn't be more happy to uh, have supported Health Affairs in this effort. We also want to acknowledge that uh, there are a number of researchers and evaluators and academicians who all contributed to this uh, uh, issue and for whom really, really, we wouldn't be able to contemplate what's working and what isn't without their input. And so we're delighted to have them, most of whom will be on the panel this afternoon. Um, uh, lastly, let me just say that um, uh, we, we launched this in September, Health Affairs did, again with support from a number of uh, funders. We started a very vigorous conversation in Southern California and we're very excited to continue that conversation today. Uh, and so uh, welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. Peter. Great. Good morning everyone. I'm Peter Long, uh, President and CEO of the Blue Shield of California Foundation and I just want to add my welcome. And when Alan presented this, I'm going to steal one of your lines, Alan, so write another one right now. Um, when he presented this in September, the, and he did somewhat, Alan has a great sense of humor, for those of you who know him, uh, leading the way, question mark. Um, and so I think that's an uh, apt description for today. And one of the things I've realized, I've been working in health policy now and health services research for the last 25 years, and oftentimes we have vigorous conversations as we're about to do something. Um, but we don't often come back and close the loop after we've done the experimentation, after we've done the work, after we've written up our results to figure out, so what? Um, what happens next? Kind of what, was the, what were the results? But more importantly, what does it mean for us as a health system? Um, and I will just preface my only remarks would be um, in addition to thanking Health Affairs and thinking there's no other um, organization that's the perfect uh, organization to have and lead this conversation. Um, using data, using information to drive our health policy. Um, but I would say one of the, my observations about uh, the American health system is we have not treated it as a complex system. And so one of the things we've not done is set up experiments intentionally, um, learn from them, and then continue to evolve and to iterate on those. And I think today it is about there are no right answers. I mean, if you think about these three, three topics around purchasing value and quality, addressing the social determinants or consolidation pros and cons, um, people may have very strong points of view, but the answers to all of these questions are pretty complex. And it really does, it's going to require a nuanced conversation to get beyond the headlines, beyond the ideologic, um, you know, kind of what's the ideology behind it into actually what's happening. Um, and in order to do that, and when we do that, then we'll be able to formulate solutions that I think will serve all of us much better. So I'm incredibly pleased to be here to welcome you and to support this effort with Health Affairs and with our friends at the California Healthcare Foundation because I believe this is ultimately how we're going to improve the American healthcare system and the healthcare system in California and ultimately make it work um, for all of us. And so I think that is ultimately all of our shared goal. We may have different points of view and different perspectives, 
but our shared goal is actually how do we make the system work better to improve people's health and well-being. So I look forward to the conversation today, and I will turn it over to Alan to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Peter. Thank you both for your leadership. Um, this was a joint creation, and uh, we could not have done it without your support, but also your intellectual guidance. Um, as has been referenced, for those of you who uh, don't follow health affairs by the minute, the, uh, uh, we, we had an event in, in, uh, Los, in, in Santa Monica where we did our traditional present the papers in the thematic issue focused on California. Today, we are uh, intentionally going beyond that, where we're not reviewing all the papers five minutes at a time, but pulling out some threads from those and having more of a policy-oriented discussion. Um, and just so you know, if you have not looked at the issue, one of the things we're now doing is creating a two-page folio data graphic which pulls out some of the key findings from the issue, so if you don't feel like reading all 200 pages, you can just get the highlights right there. Um, I uh, am going to provide what I'm calling reflections of a lapsed Californian. I, it's a little hard for me to say, but I moved from California in 1984, it's a little while ago, um, and uh, my, my parents have lived here the whole time since, so I continue to pay attention. I've always fancied myself as someone who might come back, but you can see how well that's gone. Um, and when we were putting today's agenda together, there was a sense that it might be helpful to, to take a view of California from outside of California. And so that's what I'm going to spend a few minutes doing. Now, I realize when I take this on that there's the risk of me being like the famous uh, Saul Steinberg New Yorker cartoon cover, which will show you my age, uh, which is uh, the view of the world from Ninth Avenue in Manhattan. And you, know, you can see New Jersey, but everything beyond that is pretty vague. California doesn't even appear on his uh, map. Uh, LA is out there somewhere, but it's basically next to Japan. I mean, they're, they're, so the further away you go, the greater the risk that the people who you're speaking to who actually live here and work here say, that's not who we are, that's not what we are. And I realize I'm taking a bit of a risk by sort of characterizing uh, California from afar, but I think the purpose in doing so is to uh, uh, have a bit of a context and stage setting and to, as I will return to at the end, as Peter just said, uh, get to this question of uh, the leadership of California and whether you all are leading the way. So on the first day of open enrollment, it does seem appropriate to start with where California is with respect to health insurance coverage. Um, I'm going to talk about coverage and delivery systems. We could do this along a lot of different dimensions, but that's the division line I'm going to use. When it comes to coverage, it's actually, from afar, it's a pretty easy story to tell. You all know, you among all the states have had the largest share reduction in the number of people without health insurance. Um, and given your size and given where you started, that's a, a, a big deal. Um, and it's a combination of a lot of elements. I'll get to some of the reasons why, or at least my perspective on the reasons why momentarily. Uh, from afar, you seem to have a, an effective and stable uh, insurance exchange in Covered California. Gets a lot of attention for its various initiatives. Um, it seems robust and uh, uh, integrated into the fabric. And you have a pretty clear picture of the work that remains to be done when it comes to coverage. As far as you have come, you still have, so far as I understand, about 7% uninsured. You have a pretty good sense of who they are, uh, particularly, of course, the role of people here without documentation. And you have taken various efforts to try to address those gaps in coverage with, of course, additional steps uh, to go. So from afar, your coverage story, although incomplete, uh, is really uh, one of the great success stories in the country. When it comes to issues around the delivery of care, organization and delivery, I realize that term sort of rolls off the tongue, but I'm talking here about how people access services, whether they get the care they need, when they get it, how it's integrated into their broader 
um, uh, needs and the like. I have to say my story from afar has changed a bit and my perspective has changed a bit. I have historically not thought of California as leading the way when it comes to the kinds of modifications and improvement in care delivery that we need. Um, I often refer to uh, the Kaiser conundrum. If Kaiser's so great, why doesn't it grow? Um, and is it just sort of its own little world that is not so little in California but doesn't send tentacles out, uh, tendrils that grow elsewhere? I was really struck by uh, the Berkeley Healthcare Forum report uh, I think it was using 2012 data where at the top level everyone talked about integration but when you actually looked at how the dollars flow, systems were not really integrated. And so again from afar you'd say, oh, California, the leader in integration, but even the leader wasn't really where the rhetoric would suggest it might be. Um, we, you always had this mystery around counties, uh, you know, playing this central role but in some sense giving the state an excuse not to lead and expecting actions that it, in other places would occur at the state level to happen county by county, which in some instances was successful, but it left a lot of counties behind. And as someone who has focused on issues of health delivery for a long time, my history is I would look to states like Oregon with their uh, coordinated care organizations, Washington State, my old state of Colorado, Vermont, states that were taking sort of a community-based approach to improving and organizing care systems, I wouldn't have looked to California. Um, but evidence matters. And all you have to do is look at uh, our um, uh, most recent issue of Health Affairs to understand why my perspective on where California sits in delivery system is changing. Uh, one of this, and some of this you'll hear today, not all of it because we don't have time. Um, the tremendous success story in California around reducing maternal mortality while the rest of the country is going the opposite direction. Uh, these things don't happen out of nowhere, and the story is told in the paper. I can't do justice to it now, but it suggests a potential and actual actions taken to look deep inside care systems, to look at social determinants, to uh, use data, uh, to motivate and to improve. And you couldn't tell that story if there wasn't uh, leadership. Uh, the story of, uh, of out of San Diego on reducing uh, cardiac uh, mortality, heart attack deaths. Again, this is a system story. These experiences happen when systems come together, analyze problems, analyze data, try to figure out how to work together. Um, the, uh, the, the, we also have a paper on the experience around the, the duels demonstration for Medicare Medicaid duels. And I think back to the beginning of the federal effort to uh, create that office and how California had by far, it was a demonstration, but California's demonstration was at the outset bigger than all the rest of the country combined. And it was ultimately scaled back, but still one of a handful of states uh, ta tackling what in my work over the years has been one of the most thorny issues, uh, integrating care for the most vulnerable, often frail elders or people with severe disabilities, very uh, low income, served by two programs that were not designed to interact. Someone's got to take this on and uh, California is one of the relatively few states that did so. So there are stories out there, and what there isn't is one master story. And maybe that's why partly it's because of your size, and partly it's because of the many issues uh, that are needed to move improvement in care delivery. But I think that is the story. The story is it's not a story, but there is a tremendous amount of creativity and activity going on in California. And so for me, I would say uh, my old line of, well, I'm not sure I see much going on, that doesn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say that anymore. And then there's a topic that's going to come up so many times today, I'm not going to talk about it that much, and that's the integration consolidation tension. Um, I do think this is one of the key issues going forward, that clinical integration requires actors to work together. But 
integration is also often uh, a precursor or a uh, code word or a nice way of talking about financial integration, which increases bargaining leverage in the marketplace and is a driver of cost. And the more serious we are about clinical integration, the more realistic we have to be about the potential downsides. And as I say, that's going to get a lot of airtime today, so I'm not going to spend much more time on it. From, a, from my distance, then, if what I'm seeing is a tremendous success story on coverage and some real movement on improving care delivery, I think about what are some of the factors that have made that possible here. Why has the story changed? Why is the story positive? On the coverage side, what I see is that the expansions that have occurred under uh, the Affordable Care Act are in a stream of coverage efforts. Again, a number of these described in a number of papers in our September issue, so I won't repeat them here. But California, along with a handful of other states, has made sequential efforts all the way to trying to do universal coverage to often compromising back to incremental expansions. So there was a, the groundwork was laid for discussing the importance of coverage expansions. Uh, you had the early uh, uh, Medi-Cal expansion under the ACA, and one of the things you did because you did it county by, by county is you created county buy-in, and so I think it created a, a drum beat of, of what is possible. You have a precedent of active purchasers. This is another one of the great mysteries of all time. You have CalPERS doing reference pricing, centers of excellence. How many papers do we have to publish on, uh, on these very interesting examples? And how many other purchasers are taking up these practices? Not very many. But, but you in California have large purchasers who are accustomed to the notion that you don't just pay the bills, and I think that set the stage, for example, for some of what Covered California is doing. It's not a surprise to say, actually, we're not just going to take your rate, or uh, we are going to standardize benefit packages so that people can make more effective comparisons. These are things that uh, not everyone is doing. You do have some institutions adopting, and we have a, a, a paper uh, uh, with Alan Entoven on the sort of the, managed, the, the evolution of the managed competition model. You have it in the UC system, you have it at Stanford. You have some large employers uh, who are uh, structuring markets. Um, and you invested in some infrastructure. I, I wouldn't lose sight of this. Right after the ACA was enacted, you had foundations that funded analysis of options for your state in implementing the Affordable Care Act. And Someone actually read those, and you, you did them. And, um, you know, that, that, that actually matters. You know, thinking about what are the strategic choices as a state that you're going to make um, to maximize the potential of this law, uh, it, it, it makes a difference. You have infrastructure with the California Health Interview Survey. Uh, the number of papers we've published using data from OSHPOD, these do not exist in every state. And so there's a, there's a whole, maybe I'm biased because I, the editor of a journal, but there is, uh, I am biased because I'm the editor of a journal, no maybe about it, but uh, analysis matters and, 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 and a state that has uh, foundations and universities and a private sector that, that looks at the data, invests in uh, options and creates a pathway for uh, doing what's, uh, what's possible, I, I, I think it makes a difference. And uh, a lot of states sort of went into ACA implementation without the kind of roadmap that you did. What are the factors for the successful transition around delivery system? This is very complicated, and I have to say I have more questions about this than answers. I have maybe some hypotheses. I hope you'll challenge me, not now, we don't have time, but uh, challenge me in your head and send me an email. Uh, so, uh, you know, every time I came, come to California, I, I get a taste of your New York envy. Um, you've got the cheapest Medicaid system in the country. They've got the most expensive. Um, I get it. It, it hurts. Um, but I actually think there's something about that history that has then set you up to do better in this round around delivery system. After all, uh, low payment rates led to more of a focus on primary care. Uh, and, and I, I don't mean to really put you in New York uh, juxtaposed, but we'll look back at Ninth Avenue from 
uh, the seventh floor of the Citizen Hotel. And you see, you know, academic medical centers and tremendous investment in high-end specialty care and very weak primary care systems, although many people have worked hard to, to uh, change that. Um, the, the point simply is that, that resource constraints, I believe, have set the stage for more of a focus on primary care, more of an understanding of the role that social determinants play in people's health. And therefore, as the world has moved forward, some of the thinking, uh, I believe, may have been further along in California than would have been the case if you were flush with money. Uh, don't tell New York that they're flush with money. They don't feel like they are. But compared to you, they are. Um, similarly, the, the, the somewhat uh, challenging for an outsider county-based system, I do think the existence of very robust local systems has set the stage for reform. After all, you all made the word disrip a household term. I mean, um, and debates over realignment, all of these kinds of things get a local discussion about resource and resource allocation that, again, I don't think uh, has happened in much of the country. So I, I guess what I'm trying to capture is some things that have put strain on your system, I believe, have also led to conversations that, that were precursors or uh, the foundation for some of the delivery system conversations that you're having now. Uh, the sheer scale of Medi-Cal and Covered California have focused the attention of the overall delivery system. So when I looked at California from afar, I would always talk about California as a state where you had very separate delivery systems for uh, Medi-Cal and private. And, and as uh, the uh, ACA coverage expand is, expands both through subsidized coverage in the exchange and through Medi-Cal, you can't, you can't keep that wall as, as much as it was before. Uh, Kaiser now has, if I have it right, you know, more than a million uh, Medi-Cal lives. And so, so you start breaking down some of, of these uh, barriers. And you have some tremendous local creativity. I don't need to tell you that. And just to bring in the consolidation integration issue, I do think that the pressure on prices is forcing those who are consolidating to focus as much on clinical integration as on some of the financial uh, integration because uh, there's not a lot of patience for, uh, or, or there's a lot of skepticism about whether this is all just about money. And so I think those are some of the uh, uh, precursors to the delivery system improvement. But again, I, those are just hypotheses. So I'll just close by saying when I look at what's happening from outside, I see basically a story of relatively shared values. I'm not just talking about red, blue. I, I, I'm getting tired of that. Um, but I think that the long history you have of efforts to expand coverage, the fact that you had, have had Republican as well as Democratic governors who were committed to coverage expansion um, has created a platform that says, when we have the opportunity, uh, we're going to build on it. And again, this is in some of the papers in the issue. It's sort of public policy 101. You, when the window of opportunity opens, you've got to be ready to go through it. And I think you all were ready. I also believe uh, deeply that the evolution of the demographics in California and the move of the state away from having a single uh, majority of, 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 of white, um, having happened now uh, coming up on two decades ago, has eliminated some of the opportunities for divisiveness that happen elsewhere in the country. Um, there is a sense of being in it together. I don't mean to romanticize it. But uh, there are things that are just a given here about the need to move forward as a state that are still very much up for debate in the rest of the country. So I'll close where Peter took my line. We did call it leading the way with a question mark. Um, and my marketing folks said, you have to give people outside California a reason to read this issue. If you just say California, then all the you know, people outside California will put it in a pile somewhere. But if you say leading the way, oh, are they? I, I, do I want to follow them? Uh, so uh, you know, marketing people are great. Um, never would have thought of it, but I like it. 
So if you're watching from afar, I think what you're seeing is the positive potential of the Affordable Care Act. You're seeing a state that has embraced the law and is doing with it what it can. And uh, I think the questions will be, uh, as federal pressure on the law grows or abates, partly depending on what happens in a couple of weeks, what comes next? What happens with public charge? What happens with the lawsuit challenging the law once again? Or what happens if uh, there are new openings for using the ACA as a platform for additional expansion? I do think the rest of the country will be watching. For you in California, I'll leave you with uh, maybe not a nice question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, which is, you know, you are one of the states in the country with the highest levels of income inequality. You have fairly high poverty rates. Uh, you put those two together, you, have, you also have pretty high median income. That's why you have the inequality. Um, we've gone through a pretty good run economically, and I think part of the story of shared values is that you can afford to share your values. And really the question I see for California uh, moving forward is if that formula of success uh, doesn't, is, isn't sustained, can you still hold together the shared values that have allowed you to, to make the progress you have, both on coverage and on uh, delivery system reform? And certainly I hope the answer is yes, and I have no hopes that, that, uh, that the economic environment we're in gets any worse. But I do think we have to be realistic uh, that you've made a lot of progress in what in some ways has been a pretty hospitable environment. So that's the view from afar. Uh, take it for what it is. Um, but I hope it gives you a little bit of context for uh, the conversation we're going to have today. And with that, I'm going to turn to what you really came for, which is to hear from uh, people who are uh, going to walk through a number of topics. I want to say at the outset that the division of our three panels is somewhat arbitrary, and so we're going to try to have the conversations weave in and out. So as I ask my first panelists to come up, please do so. Um, I just want to say that uh, we at Health Affairs have embraced the concepts of value-based performance. Um, last night, Debbie Boylan, who's the person who actually makes this meeting happen, I'm just up here for show, um, the hotel left her this nice bottle of wine. And so to the panelists, the nine of you today who uh, are most on time and cooperative, we have some value-based uh, <laughs> payment for you right there. So. Um, so with no further ado, let's, uh, sorry, let, let me uh, introduce you, Chris, before you come up. Um, we'll be hearing in the first panel, which is going to discuss purchasing for value and quality. We'll hear from Chris Whaley, associate policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, Tricia McGinnis, senior vice president at the Center for Healthcare Strategies, and Jeff Rideout, president and CEO of the Integrated Healthcare Association. I've asked them each to speak for five, maybe six or seven at the most minutes. Really want to get into some conversation, and I'll turn it over first to Chris, please. Thank you, Alan and, and Debbie, for organizing and for inviting me. And I'm excited to talk about employers purchasing for value in, in healthcare. Uh, I'd just like to briefly acknowledge the many organizations that have funded this research and then also acknowledge the great collaborators that I've had the opportunity to work with, and in particular, Jamie Robinson and Tim Brown at UC Berkeley. The, the underlying uh, idea for the next couple minutes is something that I'm sure many in the room are familiar with. And that's that in healthcare, there's lots of variation in prices. And just to illustrate that, this figure shows the range in colonoscopy prices for a large purchaser in California, the California Public Employees Retirement System. And I think there are two, two main takeaways from this, this chart. So one, uh, this chart shows colonoscopy prices for ambulatory surgical centers, which are the, the red dots, and hospital outpatient departments uh, for the blue dots. And if you notice, uh, for, for both types of organizations, prices range uh, a lot. So prices range from around a couple hundred dollars all the way up to almost $10,000. And I think that the second takeaway is that for ambulatory surgical centers, which is a, a different type of, of provider organization than a traditional hospital, prices are about half the price of, of a, a hospital. And so we see lots of variation both across markets and then also within different organizational features. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if there's a clear link between price and quality, but in many cases, there's not. So this is from an, another analysis, again, looking at colonoscopies. And on the bottom axis, 
you can see provider prices and standard deviation units. And then also on the vertical axis, complication rates. So what's the, the probability of having an adverse event? The lower price providers, those in the bottom corner, actually have lower complication rates than the higher price providers. So at least in this market, it's not clear that there is a, a strong link between price and quality. If anything, the relationship goes the other way than, than we'd expect. And so if you're an employer who's purchasing colonoscopy services or other healthcare services, these bottom providers are the high value provider, lower price, better quality, than the higher price providers, which are higher price and have lower quality. So why is this a problem? So in economics, we have a term called Tanstoffel, which stands for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. In health economics, we should have another term that I'm not going to pronounce that stands for there ain't no such thing as free healthcare spending. So basic economics 101 argument will tell you that if an employer spends an extra dollar on healthcare, that dollar's got to come from somewhere. The most obvious place for that dollar to come from is wages and other types of benefits. And that's something that we, we actually see going on. So this, this chart uses data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Kaiser Family Foundation and looks at compensation trends for U.S. workers between 2008 and 2018. Everything here is inflation adjusted. And we see in the top line, the costs for employers to hire a worker have steadily increased over the last decade. However, take-home pay has actually decreased on average. So in real terms, take-home pay for, for workers and wages, the, the red line, has actually fallen uh, fairly substantially. One potential culprit is the blue line, which shows health insurance uh, trends. For employers, health insurance costs have risen by about a third in the last decade. Reference pricing is one potential solution to address this problem. And the way that reference pricing works is that the payer essentially sets a reimbursement limit and says for certain providers, we're not gonna pay for our employees to go to those, those uh, providers or we're only gonna contribute a certain amount. Reference pricing uses this mechanism to incentivize patients to go to lower price providers and it moves the employer from a passive purchaser of healthcare benefits to a value-based purchaser. Many California employers are using reference pricing to achieve value. This table shows results from three uh, employers that have used reference pricing, the California Public Employees Retirement System, Safeway, and Rita Trust, which have implemented reference pricing for surgical services, diagnostic tests, and prescription drugs. Across these three, three services, Reference pricing has increased the use of low price providers by between 7 and 18.6 percentage points, which has led to a savings of 10.5% to up to 32% depending on the specific service. And so this is something that, that can actually lead to, to pretty sizable uh, savings for employers. There are several barriers that remain to programs like reference pricing and other types of innovative insurance benefit designs. So one uh, potential barrier is that uh, many insurance uh, contracts with, between insurers and, and, and providers limit price disclosure and the ability of patients to go to outside uh, uh, networks. And I'd just like to, to end and wrap up that if employers don't find ways to move towards paying for value, rising healthcare costs will continue to place downward pressure on wages and other benefits. Thank you and happy to answer any other questions. Good morning, uh, my name is Tricia McGinnis and uh, I am from the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with CHCS, we are a nonprofit organization that focuses on working with Medicaid agencies, health plans, and providers to help deliver innovative new solutions to improving the quality of care uh, and improving health outcomes for Medicaid beneficiaries. So I'm gonna pivot a bit and, and focus on uh, how Medi-Cal plays into all of this. And, what I'm seeing uh, across the states that I work with um, that could be useful uh, to California moving forward. So um, first, I just want to say, you know, we do a lot of work uh, with states and have also had the privilege of working with DHCS on the 2020 waiver, uh, in particular the prime BBP requirements, as well as the whole person care pilot and health homes. So from my vantage point, um, there's a really nice window of opportunity in California right now 
where you all have the ability to build on uh, the investments that you've made in care delivery transformation through the two 1115 waivers, uh, as well as leverage um, the upcoming Medi-Cal uh, reprocurement. Um, so it's a really nice time to reflect on how you can build on your future, on your past successes, and really think about ways to tie payment uh, to quality in ways that will move the ball forward. Um, I also want to note that, you know, what I want to focus on really is not VBP as a mechanism for lowering costs in California. As Ellen noted, um, your rates are already quite low. States uh, that I work with would be very jealous of, of those accomplishments, but really think about ways to leverage payment to really drive improvements in quality. So there are, I would say, really two main mechanisms that states uh, are using right now in their Medicaid, uh, their Medicaid realm to really drive quality. And you know, a lot of this has really evolved because of, of ACA. You know, with Medicaid expansion and Medicaid now covering a lot more lives, Medicaid agencies across the country really are, are appreciating how much leverage they have now um, as a purchaser and really are kind of stepping up to the plate and really flexing that muscle to really drive greater value from their managed care plans. And so I want to offer you um, two ways that states are doing this, particularly within the context of managed care. Um, first and foremost, one of the big trends that we've seen uh, over the past, I'd say, seven years is states using their contracts to require the adoption of value-based purchasing in ways that will more closely tie cost and payment to quality outcomes. Uh, so, for example, in New York, uh, they have the state has required their MCOs to uh, have 80% of payment of all payments between managed care plans and providers in some type of VBP arrangement by 2020, and 35% of those have to be in some kind of risk-based arrangement. Well, you all might say, "Well, we're California. We've had risk-based contracting since before you were born, Tricia. Like this is this is old. This is old news to us." But I think some of the innovations that we see going on are actually taking those VBP requirements and linking them to quality outcomes as well. And some of the ways that states are doing that is through a withhold of capitation. So for example, Washington State, your neighbor up north, uh, they have a, a withhold. It's, it's fairly modest. It's 1.5%. And they've said a portion of that is going to be tied to the health plans having VBP arrangements in place. But an even greater proportion, 75% of that, is actually tied to achieving certain health outcomes. So that there's really a linkage and an accountability for the health plans to achieve both, but really giving the plans flexibility to, to develop those arrangements directly with the providers. The state isn't prescribing particular arrangements, it's really leaving that innovation up to the plan, but really creating a, using a greater financial lever to get the plans to do so. Um, within those types, of, and we see states really adopting more and more of these across the states, states like Arizona, uh, states like South Carolina, states that have pretty low rates um, but really are able to leverage some of their, their power as a purchaser. Uh, I will note that in, in, on the opposite end of the spectrum, states are also getting more prescriptive. They're leveraging uh, things, they're taking the power that Medicare has and adopting similar programs. So for example, some states have developed ACO programs or episode of care programs that look very similar to the Medicare programs, really driving an opportunity for multi-payer alignment, but creating a, a Medicaid-specific context, using metrics that make more sense in the context of Medicaid, that really align more to quality of care. So that might be something that California could consider as well. Um, I will note, I think, three considerations as, as I look at California that I think could play a big role. I mean, first is one, you will already do have a vast amount of your contracts in risk-based arrangements, but those aren't necessarily tied directly to quality. And there really is a huge opportunity to leverage that provider capability around managing risk, which a lot of my states are highly jealous of, I'll be frank, but connecting, making those more connected to quality of care. Um, the second is, is just the rate issue um, and, and the concern that given how low rates are in California, using withhold is not tenable. And I'll just note that, that states with equally lower rates have been able to use that withhold, but there are other opportunities as well. As the California Healthcare Foundation noted in its paper, there are ways to approach rate setting so that both the state and the managed care plans can share in the savings or be rewarded 
for achieving, achieving higher quality outcomes and lower costs. And so that's definitely something worth exploring. And then finally, I'll just note that there really is an opportunity here to build on the investments that have been made under the past 1115 waivers in ways that really aren't about cutting costs, but really are about more driving greater value from the money that you are spending and creating greater flexibility for the plans and providers to do better coordination, care coordination, uh, leverage the social determinants of health, and really continue to achieve uh, innovation in this space. So looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm Jeff Reinout from the Integrated Healthcare Association. Um, I want to thank Alan and Peter and Sandra for inviting us here today. And Peter asked for nuanced information, so I will try to do that. And Alan asked for evidence-based information, so I'll try to do that. Um, <laughs> This is the third talk on this subject I've given in four days. I got 75 minutes at the APG conference in Washington, so that was great. I got 60 minutes at the House of Delegates for the CMA yesterday, and I think I get uh, seven now down to six. Um, so I will do my best as we go along. Um, and in that spirit, every word matters. So I'm going to try to tease out a little bit of the information that IHA is now producing on clinical integration, not financial integration and financial risk sharing, not consolidation. So, uh, and the relationship of those two ideas and values. So the um, bottom line really is the model matters. And that's as close to a political statement as I'll be able to make from IHA's point of view. But given that um, we are the Integrated Healthcare Association, I think it's pretty safe to say we support integrated healthcare. Um, and I really do want to stress that the value that uh, we have seen in the integrated model is pretty clear, at least in our observational data. But don't take my word for it. Uh, make your own conclusions. So the first is a uh, content-rich uh, slide, but it actually is a big thank you to a lot of organizations. And we've been um, uh, essentially looking at uh, claims level information uh, f across the state now for three cycles. Our Atlas three cycle will come up in uh, quarter one. We get this information from health plans voluntarily, 10 health plans across the state. We have tremendous financial and intellectual support from the California Healthcare Foundation. And this actually started uh, with support and leadership from the California Department of Health and Human Services. So this, for all intents and purposes, is an all-payer claims database that everybody in the state is supporting. I want to give a shout out to Jill Yegin, who's in the crowd, because uh, a lot of her leadership at IHA led us to this position. What it does for us, it complements a 15-year track record of measuring integrated healthcare in California through our value-based P4P program. And my little um, marketing plug is we now call it the AMP program, the Align, Measure, and Perform. A couple things I will say, it's about two dozen measures standardized of clinical quality. It's a standardized total cost of care measure that includes patient cost sharing, which let's not forget that patients are paying a price for the model they choose as well. Uh, it also includes facility breakdown, specialty pharmacy breakdown. So it really gets to uh, the splits and the nuance that Peter uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we can look at different product lines. We have ASO data. We have ACO data. We have covered California data. We have individual data, small group data. So a lot of this comes down to having the information and what people will let us share. Um, so with that as a background, and that's the word heavy slide, let's move on. So the model matters. This comes from 15 years of work uh, looking at integrated care models. Guess what? Performance varies across the board. Uh, each dot represents one of 200 risk-bearing organizations in California that are overseen by the Department of Managed Health Care. The right side, some very good performing groups. Left side, probably some data problems, also some lower performing groups. But if you want to look at integrated care, uh, there is variation. And unfortunately, I think we focused on the variation within the integrated community without really looking at what's happening outside the integrated community. So what we've tried to do by layering the Atlas information on is what's the integrated care average look like? And this is for uh, hemoglobin A1C. We're measuring, like I said, 20, 30 different measures. It's true for every measure, every clinical measure, every patient experience measure, every cost measure. So the average is not bad. It's not great. 
Uh, when we look at the upper echelon of those groups, it gets much better. And this represents um, a portion of the groups that do well on the clinical measures. We also look at those that do well on the patient experience measures and those that do well on total cost. Here's what I want to show you that probably doesn't get enough attention. This is the statewide average for that same measure. So this is a geographic look at the same measure, measured the same way. It includes the integrated groups, so methodologically we're probably flawed in showing you that. Um, but it gives you an idea of kind of where the state plays on that particular measure. And then this is the highest regional average. So I think if you believe that clinical uh, integration matters, this is a first cut at that. And like I said, we can look at every measure we uh, have that same way. The other thing that I am not going to show you but comes up every time, the people that are good at one thing are good at a lot of things. Uh, the groups that are good in commercial are good in Medicare Advantage. The groups that are good at diabetes are good in respiratory. So in some ways, this is sort of the proof point that I can give you about the value of, of integrated groups. This cuts across commercial, Medi-Cal. In Southern California, some of these groups, half of their business is Medi-Cal now. Uh, and in the Empire, and I think Brad Gilbert's here today, um, many of the groups they work with, it's over 60%. So there, this, this notion that the Medi-Cal network is distinct from the commercial network, I mean, that was 10 years ago. Uh, and that's one of the things that we have to let go of, that these groups are serving uh, Medicare Advantage. They're serving all lines of business. Um, you want to put it in, in human terms, it's almost 79,000 more diabetics that are getting better blood sugar control. All right, this is the money slide, and it truly is the money slide. A little bit of explanation. Left hand of the graph is a composite of 10 uh, clinical quality measures, all measured the same way. Right hand on the graph is geographically wage and clinically risk adjusted total cost of care. What we're looking at is the different model types by how they get the money. No risk, professional risk, or full risk. So slightly different view, uh, probably related to consolidation, probably related to financial integration, but these are the capitated uh, and non-capitated performance comparisons that we can do. Uh, no risk, uh, and important, this excludes Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser uh, does very, very well. We wanted to look at this without Kaiser. We can do it either way. A uh, little bit of risk, you get a lot of improvement. A little bit more risk, you get even more improvement. What about cost? Um, starts a little high, goes down, goes down. So I'm not a statistician. Um, I just play one at home. Um, but this looks like a, a pretty important thing to look at. Uh, this, and to me, and with all due respect to Peter's comments, I'll keep coming back to it, this is more than nuance in my mind. And this is really about a delivery model that seems to be performing well, at least in terms of what we say is important. Um, and then the last thing, ACOs. If I could strip that uh, acronym out of the vocabulary, I would do it in a second, because we all know how to spell it. But what I experience is that people imagine that integrated care didn't exist before ACOs. And guess what? It's existed for 20, 30 years, and it's performed pretty well. Um, where do you think it's going to land? Right there. OK? And there's a lot in this. Uh, remember, this is we, we track this by member. So we get the information for each enrollee from the health plan, whether it's not, they're in an ACO or not. And this says a lot of things. It's two years old. So you got to have that as in mind. This was a new model. ACOs seem to have addressed the uh, cost problem in their uh, formation. At this point, it hasn't addressed really the quality issue. So are these members getting access to the integrated care infrastructure? Are they uh, getting uh, access to the right uh, organizational groups? And the jury's out. This is ACOs and PPOs and ACOs and HMOs. Let me see if we can use more acronyms. I think I'm almost done. Uh, let's not forget what it also means. Uh, it means a lot to the member and their cost sharing. And a nod to Betsy, who's talking later, I think, this morning. Um, you know, we can all say, oh, that's just because it's benefit design. The HMOs, you know, don't, don't cost shift. Well, guess what? The HMOs don't cost shift. So you can call this benefit design or risk sharing or whatever you want. But what we are seeing in our data now is that it's not just a cover California problem in terms of the actuarial value. It's an ASO self-funded employer problem. It's 20, 30 percent of the total cost of care. So when we forget to include the patient cost sharing component in the total cost of care, we really do a disservice to the people that we all say we're trying to serve. And it's getting very, very expensive out there. So I'll stop with that. I've got a lot more I could say. I do want to say one of the things that did come up from the September meeting was what's the relationship between clinical integration and consolidation? Um, 
We want to work very closely, and we will be, with the uh, Petra Center at Berkeley under the direction of Dr. Shortell, who's on our board, and Dr. Scheffler, to actually say what is the value of clinical integration and what's its relationship to consolidation. And I think when we can start to ask those higher order questions, we're going to see it, it is a nuanced uh, environment, and we do have to think about how do we approach surgically uh, as opposed to just with a blunt hammer what the problem is and what we need to solve. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Alan. Our, our goal is to be a little more uh, conversational as much as we can be. Um, is this, can you all hear? You can. I can't hear myself. So, that's good. so uh, let, let, let's just start at the highest level here, which is um, I heard a range, this panel is on purchasing. And I heard a range of strategies, if that's maybe not exactly the right word, but a range of approaches from a withhold tied to a measure of quality to integration is good and all else follows. I, forgive me for oversimplifying both, but that can, and as a purchaser, you've got to sort of decide where you're putting your energy. Are you trying to measure quality? and figure out how much to withhold and how much to return based on what measures uh, and, and push that through? Or are you standing further away and saying, you figure out how to do it. We know how to structure the contract. But from there on, it's up to you. And I'd, I'd just be interested. And, and, and Chris, you, you gave some specific examples of things that employers can do. Um, but as you noted, they're not doing a lot of those. So, so is where in the continuum from uh, micromanagement, if you will, all the way to let the delivery system do it, give them a couple of signals, and let them take it from there. Where should a purchaser be thinking? Whoever wants to take it. Um, well, I guess what I'd start with, um, and Alan, with all due respect, um, I hope the message was, was not integration is good and all else follows. The message was integration can be good. And a lot of other things have to be considered at the same time. So I don't, um, I, I think if we ignore the value of integration when it seems to be related to um, better cost sharing for patients and lower cost for regional comparison, we do that at our apparel. Um, and I would say on reference pricing, because I've you know, watched this evolve, uh, who pays the bills when, it's, when they don't go to a reference center? I mean, and what if I don't need a colonoscopy? I mean, you know, we go through bundle payments and everything else. Who are you going to trust to actually look after your whole person? Um, and so, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of integrated care, obviously. I grew up in it. I trained in it and all that other stuff. I just think it, it, it shouldn't be put to the side while we think that we're solving higher order issues. And I, I think that's a good point. I think with reference pricing, it, it, you know, for better or for worse, puts the onus of, of making healthcare decisions on the patient and put, you know, places the patient in charge of deciding where to go for, for very specific services. And if you look at kind of the, you know, so that works well when there's kind of, uh, you know, is a mechanism at least when the healthcare system is very fragmented and there, there are, uh, you know, ranges in prices, uh, you know, potentially no link between price and quality. If you look at the opposite end of, of spect uh, the spectrum, uh, for example, Kaiser, uh, there is no reference pricing in Kaiser because Kaiser is the one making the decision for you. Uh, Kaiser is a, a fully integrated model in some senses, doing the, the negotiation on your behalf, and there's not a, a need for you as a patient to make those types of decisions because the underlying problem doesn't exist. And so I, I think that programs like reference pricing, uh, high deductible plans, price transparency, et cetera, are potential solutions for a non-integrated healthcare uh, world, uh, which is, you know, for better or for worse, uh, the world that many people live in. But uh, before Tricia answers, I, I'm, I'm going to push back a little, because my read of the results from reference pricing, it, it's true that the onus is on the individual, but the, the, the effect is that the other providers who were, were pricing above the reference price seeing that they're going to lose business, bring their prices down. That's a form of leverage that hopefully pushes cost out of the system. And if you're integrated and you're just sort of taking it all as it comes, 
you don't have that pressure. So I guess I, I'm trying to figure out how we bring the pressure to bear here. I realize it, you, I guess I'm just thinking you painted a somewhat more negative picture of, of how, it, how it actually works out than, than I read it. So I guess to be clear, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of reference pricing for the context uh, in which it's been applied. And I think that we do have those kind of dual benefit of it induces employer employees to price shop and to go to lower price providers. And that price shopping, uh, there's a, a market response and providers do bring down their prices. And so I think uh, if if everyone had reference pricing and that was kind of the, the cultural norm for consuming healthcare in the US, we would probably have a much more competitive healthcare market in the country. Sorry. Uh, no, no, I mean, so, so obviously the, the issue of reference pricing isn't quite as, as salient in the Medi-Cal space. I mean, I guess I would say from my vantage point, given how large California is, um, I, I think a, 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 an approach where the purchaser says, here's what I want to get out of my contracts in terms of quality achievement, achievement of specific quality measures, here's how I want my plans to perform relative to some benchmark. You plan, figure out how to accomplish that given the intricacies of your market, but there needs to be a standardized set of measures, otherwise the providers are gonna be driven crazy, and that the MCOs that do well under those um, requirements reap some financial benefit from doing so. I, I mean, I think those are the primary principles that we see working well in other states the size of California that I think can work well here. Um, and it feels like you know, folks are more than halfway there in terms of, of the risk arrangement and it's really about, about um, the requirements around achieving quality measures and, and using whatever levers make sense at the local level um, and whatever models um, and innovation happen to, to achieve those, those quality expectations. So that's helpful. Um, Jeff, I, um I didn't mean to caricature your position any more than I, than I, I, I didn't mean to caricature it. Uh, <laughs> just leave it right there. Any more than I did, that's not helpful. Um, anyway, but, but I, um, Trisha, I'm thinking about what you just said, and then Jeff, your comment, which I also mentioned at the outset, which is you don't really have divisions of delivery systems anymore because people are, you've got providers taking a broad array of, of, of patients, and then, um, so I guess my question is, how much alignment do we need between the public and private? Because Tricia, you began by saying there are tools you can't use for the public. But if from the provider side, we always hear you want a consistent set of messages, and then there are some tools you can't use because you've got some public payers. How, how, do, we, how, how do we align sort of the strategy at the public and private level when the levers that are available both from a finance perspective and from a uh, sort of a legal structural perspective are really different in the public and private sides. Do you want me to go first? Um, I think from, from the national perspective, you know, I think it really, at least as a starting point, alignment has to start with the quality expectations, right? I mean, we shouldn't be expecting less um, from the delivery system that serves low income but, uh, enrollees than the systems that you know serve higher income enrollees. So a consistent set of measures that can also be tailored, though. Um, you know, I think a lot of states are starting with a, you know a core set that has some optional measures that you can bring in depending on what the patient population is and what the needs are of that local community. That can work quite well to create some expectations that here's the baseline that we expect for everybody but with some flexibility for you know, issues that matter more for low income populations like social determinants and other factors that, that play a bigger role probably in their health than others. I mean, I would suggest that's a, a pretty key starting point. Um, but welcome Jeff's observations as well. Yeah, I think clearly a standard uh, measurement set is important, but standard benchmarking and a track record of actually what's the, what are the processes to add measures. We don't have enough social determinant of health measures retire measures that don't show wide variation or performance opportunity. All of that requires an infrastructure and right now in California we have started through IHA and PBGH a standard ACO, commercial ACO measure set that we have five health plans including four nationals. We are talking to AHIP and we're talking to the National Business Group on Health to make that a national model. It's not territorial, it's just 
let's not reinvent the wheel and say we're doing collaboration five times over um, because it is a national challenge. Um, and I think with the Medi-Cal world, we have one Medi-Cal plan that's using our standard set. We have a core measure set that 70% uh, of the EAS measures are covered under our oversight. We can add the other 30% pretty easily. So I think it's just saying if you want to go to a single source so that you're not driving everybody crazy, uh, we, we're pretty close to having something like that ready to go. It's just people have to say, I want to use that instead of that. And one of the purchasers, we have three large, five large purchasers on our board. What they had to come to terms with was they were creating some of the crazy making themselves. It wasn't all a health plan problem. Um, so standardization requires people to standardize, I guess is the way I'd put it. Right, so now building on tweet. that, right, requiring, getting, getting not just the health plans to commit, but, but the purchasers as well. I think that, I think that really is key. Chris, you want to jump? Uh, okay. So, um, so I heard the standard, I heard a nice starting point uh, around the metrics, but now let's get to the payment side of it for the purchaser. So let's imagine you're, uh, the, fir the first step is done. You've got nice alignment across payers around what we're trying to accomplish. But still, um, the, the payment environment, the payment rules are quite different across these sectors, and they're all affecting uh, how people deliver care. So what comes next after that first step in terms of alignment? These are easy questions. I don't know yeah. why you all are pausing. Well, again, everybody has to run their own business. I say start running it, as Tricia pointed out, with standardized metrics um, where you really know where you are versus where you want to be. Um, and be honest about what you're measuring. I mean, to say that um, a non-integrated product option is cheaper because you're excluding everything that you're pushing over to the consumers just isn't a fair statement. And if you look at the rate submissions to Covered California um, over the last three or four years, one thing that I, because I was the medical director there for several years, one thing I always noticed was the integrated care options were always middle to low single digits. And the ones that did not offer integrated care were the ones that were approaching 20%. So there's a lot of observational information out there that says there are certain models that work, but you have to want to pursue a performance-based agenda and then sort of what you choose to do in an individual market because you have to because there's no integrated options or because that's the way that particular market behaves. That's sort of the secondary consideration, not the not where you start. And I would just say in uh, in the Medicaid realm, you know, what, what we've seen some states have a lot of success around is, is leverage the Medicare methodologies. Um, in ACOs, you know, a lot of the states that have statewide programs look first to the MSSP or next gen model and then make, you know, tweaks to risk adjustment, quality measures, outliers, you know, they, they, they fiddle around the edges of the methodology to a way that seems palatable to providers, enough so that providers will actually sign on and be certified. Um, so that there is some baseline consistency and providers kind of know what they're what they're working on and, and similar with the episodes of care. I think the question is how to bring that kind of approach into a purchasing arrangement where you're not specifying specific models, you're leaving most of it up to and, and how to create some baseline standardization around the payment methodology. And we haven't we the states that I've been working with haven't quite gotten to that that point of, of melding the prescriptive with with the flexible. But that's you know I think that's one promising approach that that folks could think about and take as a, a jumping off point for sure. And I, I think on the employer side, maybe one reason why we are where we are now is that these types of decisions, if we want to move to say something like preference pricing or move towards integrated care, uh, require trade-offs on behalf of employees and, and other dependents. And so I think if, you know, regardless of what type of model you, you move to, whether it's reference pricing or, or uh, integrated care models, there has to be that conversation with, with employees and uh, uh, about, about what are the benefits and why are we moving toward these models and what are the other effects on benefits. Because again, as I said earlier, you know, a dollar in, in healthcare costs comes from somewhere. Great. Okay, we have time for some questions from you all. Uh, we have a microphone and we're video casting this, so we want to make sure you get on tape. Let's start over here. You'll get your chance. And we'll 
come over here and we'll see how we're doing on time. And please uh, stand, identify yourself so folks can see who's asking a question. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for starting a great conversation. I heard sli something slightly different than uh, Alan in terms of purchasing. I, I heard a search for value, um, which I think is um, both laudable and necessary. Um, I'm Larry Ozern with Clinical Informatics. My question is, Oh. We'll get you. Is that better? That sounds okay. I just have to hold it closer. Sorry. Um, so thank you for studying the value conversation. Uh, I'm Larry Ezrin with Clinical Informatics. My question is um, a little bit broader, related to the Medicare Incentive Payment Program. Um, when we're talking about value, and I think that um, both you know two of you talked about um, you know cost uh, as a relates to quality, um, and yet the MIPS program rewards um, quality and cost separately. Um, what do you think we need to do to um, change how um, MIPS rewards value if we're going to get to values? It seems like we're going to have a really hard time getting to value if we consider cost and quality separately. Well, my personal opinion, and this is personal, is that MIPS um, has its challenges in a big way, <laughs> as does the alternate payment model um, design, especially when it doesn't allow for uh, options that reflect next gen and, and even beyond next gen. So uh, one of the things I'd, I'd stress is if, if you're going to reward value, you have to put those two pieces together. And if you incent them separately, you're going to get kind of odd results. The other thing I'd say is that at least in California, from what I see, most of the uh, action tends to be in Medicare Advantage, which is largely around an integrated model. And most of the provider community uh, likes that model and, and responds well to the incentives that are built into that model. So I think you'd have to say, well, who's, who's MIPS intended to support? And is that really where we want to go? And I didn't, of course, have time to do this, but the uh, strength of the integrated model is even more dramatically exposed in Medicare Advantage, uh, either on a per person basis or per dollar basis. So I think it's got some flaws and I'm not sure CMS quite knows what they're going to do with that. Got, uh, someone right here in the center. A little further up. Right there. Hi, good morning. My name is Cindy Young and um, there's uh, a lot of discussion of why employers don't engage and it's because they're not asked to engage. What happens is that these decisions get made on contracting or on reference price pricing and then they're told if your employees don't go to a particular facility to get a hip replaced, then they're only gonna get reimbursed X. And so I think larger purchasers, maybe like CalPERS or you know, our Medicaid program, Medi-Cal program are engaging in those type of strategies, but the decisions are getting made um, at, a, at a higher level and employers are not engaging simply because there's no place at the table in which for them to do so. And so if you want employers to engage or we're lacking in employer engagement, how do you see then opening up those doors? Yeah, so I, I certainly agree with that. So for example, CalPERS has a in-house research shop that is very uh, great about thinking about changes to benefit designs, what's the right way to change benefit designs, and what's the, the best way to, to roll these out to, to its members. Smaller employees don't have that, that luxury. And so there's got to be something about uh, that, that enables smaller employers to make those same types of decisions because they're facing the exact same cost that CalPERS and other large employers are, are facing. I think the other thing that probably deserves notice, there are models where employers are going directly to large provider organizations, and that probably doesn't work well uh, in every market for every employer, but it's certainly a way that some employers um, are sort of taking it directly. I mean, if there is a way to just increase the, the level of information that employers have to make these types of decisions, uh, and I, I don't know the best way to do that, but I think that would be uh, an important next step. So we have the person in the back here. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm uh, Kristen with the Children's Partnership. Um, I, I've been struggling with trying to figure out um, the children's ROI, for lack of a better word, because for the most part, children are healthy and really investing in their quality of care is really difficult to measure in any of those short-term measures that most purchasers and health plans are operating in. 
and I'm curious if you've heard any examples of where they have developed <coughs> strategies of you know, creating proxies or something along the way so that quality can be a feature in otherwise healthy children so that we can look at, because there are such incredible benefits in the long term for if those children become healthy, to make them healthy adults. Right. Yeah, I mean, clearly the dynamics are different for kids because the investments that you make are not going to have a, a return on investment typically in the one year time frame. Um, so one, one interesting thing that, that Ohio actually is doing is it's um, creating incentives for its MCOs to work at a local level around kindergarten readiness. So, you know, they, they obviously have the well child visits and the immunizations and all the, the typical fetus things, but they are also layering on uh, kindergarten readiness as a standard to really incentivize the investments that really have to happen in the first thousand days. New York Medicaid has just launched a first 1,000 days initiative. There's a lot going on um, in the early childhood space. Um, a lot of it isn't necessarily happening within the realm of VBP because of that, that ROI challenge. Um, but I think there are ways to think about measures um, and, and not necessarily penalize uh, plans for not meeting them, but really reward those plans that are doing a good job of lo working with local community-based organizations and schools to really um, do the early childhood interventions that we know have an evidence base for producing outcomes over the long term. The only thing I'd add to that is that the more the measures proliferate, the less chance there is that we can focus on the things like that that matter. So standardizing the measure set so you can add things that are more interesting uh, and impactful is important. And I'd, I'd put housing on that list, uh, for instance. Um, so I think it's one of those things where as the, the chaos gets bigger, uh, the chances of looking at special needs populations or particular populations diminishes and so everybody should be fighting for alignment really I'll just say the challenge here also is that a, a lot of the early work on measures comes out of Medicare and uh, once you start talking about populations that aren't on Medicare you have a different set of needs which is how the children's issue comes up but that's not the only place where you have that kind of uh, distortion um, let's do one last question but we'll keep it quick and uh, then we'll go to a break hi uh, um, following on that question, I guess I'm wondering what the appetite is of employers for more social impact investing around the community level issues, whether it's opioids or housing or you name it, um, that really can't be solved even within the delivery system. So I know that's exploding this way bigger, but I'm curious how employers look at that question. So that, that's a hard question to, to end with. Uh, I, I think employers, yes, are, are interested, uh, but then, you know, obviously face challenges investing in those areas, uh, especially when, when the, the return on investment may not actually accrue to them, and it, you know, more than likely accrues to their, you know, not their employees and other members of the community, and also won't accrue for a long period of time. Yeah, and Claudia, this isn't specific to employers, but I've been really encouraged in the last couple of years that the having housing on the table for discussion is really exciting, and that's coming through provider organizations that see this as an important transitional step for discharge. It's coming uh, as a part of a social determinant support network. So um, I would I would love to see more of that. All right, well, we're off to a nice start. We have two more panels that are just going to keep going, but please join me in thanking. We have a, a brief break, and we'll see you back in a little more than 10 minutes. You may have noticed an empty seat up here. We're going to go ahead and start. Uh, we know Jennifer Kent has a busy schedule, and uh, rather than just pushing everything back up. Oh, we have the high sign, so perfect timing. There we go. Great. Okay. You don't have to run. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Our second panel is going to talk about uh, social determinants and care integration. Again, the theme across the day. Um, we'll hear from uh, authors of two papers that we had in September issue that describe initiatives, some of which I mentioned in my opening. Uh, Brad Gilbert, CEO of Inland Empire Health Plan, 
and Elliot Main, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Stanford University. And of course, uh, we'll also hear from Jennifer Kent, Director of the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, let's begin with Brad to talk about uh, his work. I got my timer going. So I'm very excited because there were two MPPs here. I'm an MPP. I never hardly ever see anybody with, the, with that particular degree. So a couple of thoughts. Give a level set for Inland Empire. Everybody forgets about the Inland Empire. 4.5 million people in those two counties. We cover 1.24 million. So we cover about 26% of the population. So Jeff's comments about a lot of overlap in the network is, is absolutely true because of the size that we have. So about three years ago, I went to our governing board and I said, I want spending authority for $25 million to do an experiment and a pilot based on theory, based on some data that said point of care integration of care can make a difference. So Jeff and the others in the panel before talked about integration at the, at the more group level, but I'm going to talk about point of care at the delivery level. So really talking about at point of care, how do you organize yourselves to do um, integrated care? I love these slides, they do that, okay, sorry. So what was very different about our experiment or pilot was we had very unusual sites. We had the typical primary care sites, county clinics, federally qualified health centers, et cetera. But what we did that was very different is we involved behavioral health clinics, including a substance use treatment site. We involved a CBAS, a community-based adult services center or adult day health center. We involved a pain clinic, a center of excellence pain clinic, and we involved an assisted living facility. So our sites were very different. All of them were under the same model, a delivery of care organized around providing a whole person care approach to people. And so if you see, it was about 7,000 IEHP members. They had to have both a chronic medical condition and a chronic behavioral health condition. So these were very high risk individuals. They had to score high on the Johns Hopkins ACG risk scores, and we had to believe that they would benefit from care management. That was how they were enrolled at all of these different sites. So it was a total of 30 sites actually across 12 healthcare. The team was an RN as the clinical lead, a, either an LCSW or an LMFT as the behavioral health social um, worker uh, person, and then a care coordinator or community health worker. And so those teams were put in all of the sites. The real key was assessing the member. But before I do that, I want to talk about what made the biggest difference was the coaching. So we hired some outstanding coaches, uh, JCC Consulting, Jennifer Clancy, who now actually works for us. And that was the way you could actually make a difference in those clinics because you, integrated care doesn't just happen. You don't just stick a nurse, a social worker, and a care coordinator in a clinic and go, yay, we have integrated care. You actually have to have it organized and coached so that the team knows how to work together. They know how to work with the physician who's providing the care, the primary care or the behavioral health care. They have to be able to work with the medical assistants. You've got to have an organized approach to the process and the workflow because it's constant assessment and reporting. And more importantly, it's really making sure you're taking care of that whole person. So coaching to get the teams integrated, to do huddles, daily huddles, where you huddle around the patients that are coming in that day to figure out what are their issues that you need to deal with and whether it's predominantly a behavioral health issue, it's a medical issue or whatever. So really organizing those teams. And that coaching was ongoing throughout the entire length of the program, which was about um, two and a half years roughly for that $25 million. The final piece that I mentioned here, and then I'll go to some of our measurements, was assessing the member doing a real assessment. If you don't assess, you don't know. If you don't know, you can't change. So you've really got to make sure that you've got a, a, a wide scope of assessments. So they did health risk assessments. They did uh, PHQ-9s, depression screening, GAD-7 for anxiety. They did a global health survey. They did a substance use assessment survey. And then they did a series of measurements on all the members around various clinical metrics, depending on the member's particular scenario. That was the key with a real focus on social determinants of health. Not necessarily specifically because of this program, but because of the need in general. IEHP is in the housing business. 
We are housing people. We've housed over 50 people already, either coming out of long-term care facilities that didn't have a place to go, or homeless individuals that were high risk. So really, that, that focus on assessing social determinants has driven the plan to start investing, literally, in housing. So we had good results. You can see these, they're in their paper, so I won't belabor them. I thought that one of the most impressive was systolic blood pressure, got it below 140. Um, still got a little ways to go on depression. I'd, I'd point out that their value at baseline for the PHQ-9 was extremely high, and now at least it's lower, still not as low as we'd like it to be. Hemoglobin A1C down below nine. Body mass index, this is after only a year. So think about some of those changes in a year are very impressive. A little tougher to get body mass index and, and uh, some extent the hemoglobin A1C down after only a year. The other thing that's really important is, does this work for the providers? Does this make a difference in their life in terms of their ability to care for the individuals that they're responsible for? So we did a questionnaire, this is a while ago. So the providers are on the right, the team experience. Often when you make changes, initially it's difficult. So we've got a follow-up to this that we'll have the data available in a few weeks, so we'll see how that goes. Members were very happy. We have testimonials, we have videos. Members were very pleased with their ability to get this member-focused, whole-person-focused care delivery for them in all of these different settings. So just a couple comments, and then I'll wrap up. The most difficult sites were the behavioral health sites. Bringing primary care to them was hard for two reasons. One is hiring somebody who could work in that setting. So there's a lot of difficulties around hiring either a physician or a, nurse, or a family nurse practitioner. Second was they deliver care differently. Medical clinics are focused on intervention, measurement, intervention. Not so much with a behavioral health clinic providing or a substance use um, treatment center providing care over time to a person. So getting them to get used to that really focused measurement and um, um, treat to measurement was, was difficult. Pain management clinic did great. We have this incredible center of excellence pain management clinic that did, was one of the best in, in terms of outcomes and delivery. So just those comments, I'll let it go at that. We'll go on to our next provider. Good morning. I'm going to summarize 10 years of work in my six minutes. Uh, uh, the, this is really about scale. You know, how, how to, you, what can we do with a state the size of a country, of a, of a California as many births as France or, or England? Uh, I lived in Vermont for many years that has 7,000 births. Uh, California has 500,000 births. So it is a different scale issue, uh, but it, that's the challenge, because if we can do something in California, that means we can do something at the national level. Uh, and this is really about, sh about sharing, sharing in terms of efforts and sharing in terms of data uh, that involves many different partners. Uh, but I would like to start off by saying that maternity care has no lack of variation. We see this in every measure, huge variation. C-section rates and maternal outcomes and baby outcomes all around the state. So it's always where there's variation, there are opportunities. So this is going to be organized around what we felt looking backwards over the 10 years of experience is what is our four keys for improving maternity care at scale. Uh, we linked extensively public health surveillance data to action. Um, mobilizing a broad range of public and private partners, including basically many of the people in this room, uh, developing a rapid cycle maternal data center that can give feedback on a variety of measures at, that is both low burden and rapid cycle, and in, in implementing a, a long series of data-driven large-scale quality improvement projects. So California has one-eighth of all the births in the United States, one state here. How uh, this is our uh, maternal mortality rate in California is in blue and U.S. is in red. Uh, we started uh, 
uh, with the Maternal Mortality Review Committee when the State Department of Public Health noted a rise in maternal mortality in 2006 uh, and had the foresight to, to set up a committee that really looked at quality of care, not just the demographics in this, of the maternal outcomes. Maternal, the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative was started in, uh, a few months later with an a action arm uh, of toolkits and collaboratives to, to directly improve the quality of care for mothers. And what we saw over time was a pretty impressive decline in maternal mortality, whereas the U.S. Uh, rose in the same time period. So what were the keys? Uh, the key was to partner with everyone that we could see. Uh, as you see here, uh, a lot of attention from many state agencies, including Jennifer Kentz and DHCS, but the Department of Public Health from Oshpot, uh, from Vital Records, uh, but also every professional group in California, uh, every, every hospital system. So this was a, an area that the Kaisers could work with the Sutters, with the Providence and the Dignities, the Sharps and the, and the, uh, uh, and the Scripps. So everyone got together uh, to work on, on shared protocols uh, and shared approaches. So that was, that was a piece of work, shall we say. Uh, and then there are a lot of com consumer and public input from March of Dimes and Consumers Union, many others, uh, and the hospital association. So uh, this is where I've spent a lot of my time, is working with organizations as well as working with uh, individual professionals. Data is really critical for driving quality improvement, uh, and this is where uh, we felt really strong about transparency. Uh, so this was an innovative approach from the Department of Public Health on the vital records where they are providing us every birth certificate on every birth in California 30 days after the end of every month. Okay. De-identify, we don't have names, social security numbers, but that gives a foundation. To that we add now uh, me the medical record discharge data, uh, ICD-9s, ICD-10s, and discharges from uh, every hospital in the state, uh, delayed a year and a half or so from Oshpot, but then now from 213 of the 240 maternity hospitals, we're getting that again 30 days after the end of the month. So this is rapid cycle data that is basically recycled. So it's not new data collection, but it's reusing data uh, that we can then do uh, a whole series of, of interactive analytics uh, through a very, very user-friendly web portal. Uh, with all the partners that we have, we've been able to do multidisciplinary toolkits that really drive quality improvement, and also with the toolkit mem uh, members help uh, lead quality improvement around the state. And these have basically been able to establish uh, uh, a, a base for quality improvement that's standardized throughout the state. Large-scale quality improvement started in 2008 with a variety of hemorrhage and, and preeclampsia, hypertensive uh, uh, task force and collaboratives, which are basically ways of coaching. Uh, Brad was talking about coaching at the uh, micro level. This is coaching at the macro level, uh, working with hospitals and, and medical groups uh, to implement best practices. Uh, um, our latest collaboratives now are working on uh, supporting vaginal birth and reducing primary C-section, which is, again, using the same partners and the same approaches. Our work is not finished. Uh, we, we get an incomplete. Uh, this is maternal mortality by race. As is seen in the nation, we saw in, also in California, uh, where you see, uh, whites are the solid line here, uh, Hispanics, and Asians are all very similar. African-American women in California have three times higher maternal mortality rate than whites. Uh, we saw the fall in, in all women in California. We saw a fall in African-Americans, but it's still three times higher. This is disgraceful for our society and is uh, an area that we are working on going forward. Uh, and we see this also in C-section rates and morbidity and so forth. So this is one of our societal challenges. Uh, we are looking 
Uh, we are th thankful for many of our supporters. CHCF has been a strong supporter of us, as well as the CDC and, and the Department of Public Health Title V. Our next initiatives are focusing on uh, opioids, uh, health equity, and uh, mental health. Thank you. Good morning. I'm, I'm noticing that you have a bottle of wine. Is that a, there a reason for that? <laughs> It, it gets rough later on, I guess, during the afternoon. Um, so Jennifer Kent with uh, Department of Healthcare Services, and the way I was uh, thinking this would go um, is actually great to hear Brad talk about uh, the work that he's done on a provider level and certainly Elliot's work kind of at a larger kind of hospital system. But where we are with the Department of Healthcare Services, um, we generally speaking run six delivery systems um, for care in our state programs so everybody often thinks oh it's a fee-for-service versus managed care type of approach and those are two um, but then you also can add in uh, California Children's Services which is its own kind of standalone very specialized fee-for-service uh, system for certain populations um, we have a mental health uh, system that is operated through 56 county mental health plans. We have uh, substance use disorder uh, services that are run through the same county uh, mental health uh, or behavioral health agencies, but there, that breaks down pretty quickly into counties that have uh, opted into our um, SUD ODS waiver, and then we have other counties that are still just providing the state plan services, and then we have dental dental uh, fee-for-service, dental managed care. So once you start to kind of get into this and say, we have populations in the state, we're serving over 13 million Californians, they can be in up to all six delivery systems, if not more, especially if you start to consider that some of our populations also have um, IHSS, which is through Department of Social Services, and if they have an intellectual disability, they may be receiving services under DDS. So once you start to kind of think about um, all the different navigation points of where these individuals can and um, should be receiving services. Um, what we have really tried to do over the last few years is kind of target on some very kind of critical populations that are clearly struggling to um, push through these various delivery systems. And it's not to say that, you know, in a glorious, perfect world, we would have just one single system that would take care of everything, pay for everything, coordinate everything. But um, history is what it is. The state is what it is. Um, the delivery systems have been created in some cases, um, such as uh, CCS, since 1927. Um, so these are long-standing historic um, delivery systems with financing that is very specifically attached. So I know that some of you have heard um, a little bit or maybe not so much around our whole person care approach. So this is in our current uh, Medicaid 1115 waiver in which um, the County of San Diego, so if they're here, I will give them a call out for um, kind of conceptualizing what turned out to be a really good idea is they had a um, county-based program called the Project 25, which was they looked at the top 25 users of their 911 system and said, who are these people and, you know, and why are they calling us so much? And when you looked at who they were, um, they were individuals that were most likely homeless, uh, seriously mentally ill, substance use. They were in and out of the jail. They were in and out of the emergency rooms in the area. They may or may not have been receiving general assistance. They may or may not have children that are in foster care. You know, when you kind of unpacked each of these individuals and said, what is causing um, them to continue to kind of come into these various county services. The other uh, revolutionary thing that uh, San Diego decided was, wow, um, everybody knows who this person is uh, because they impact all these different county systems. And so we took that concept um, in our 1115 waiver and we said counties that want to participate in this, and it's uh, $300 million in federal available funds on a five-year basis, so a total of a billion and a half dollars. Um, we wanted counties to work across uh, their systems to share data, to coordinate services, and a lot of the things that our whole person care allows us to do are things that you would not otherwise be able to do in a Medicaid program. So think about um, funding for sobering centers, 
Think about funding for mobile outreach teams. Think about supportive housing, so first and last month's rent, or some of the transitional housing that is being provided. And the idea and the concept of whole person care was really around um, trying to address not only what the physical health conditions and challenges were for these individuals, but also trying to support them in a way going forward that their um, both health outcomes as well as their larger um, quality of life were improved. I think that um, these kinds of systems, and I, I know Elliot um, would certainly be able to attest to this, take a while, right? Patience, um, when you're doing big, large-scale integration or coordination activities, you have to kind of put yourself into a marathon type of approach as opposed to a sprint, because the data itself um, and the results oftentimes take a while to trickle down to, you know, in Brad's case, down to the provider level. So we at the state really see our job is how do we um, knock down barriers, be it uh, data use agreements or financing uh, problems and hurdles. How do we force uh, people to talk to each other? And you'd think that that's kind of um, a simple thing to do, but it's actually remarkably difficult getting a you know, big, difficult health plan to talk to uh, not one but two counties. I mean, that's outrageous. Um, I see Liz Gibney out here. She's got 14 counties. Uh, so, you know, you start talking about how do you work within these very large systems with a lot of um, different players, a lot of different agencies. And so what we have really kind of tried to do in our department is what are the things that we can administratively do to make those communications easier, to make those um, touch points more um, nimble, and then obviously to help work to smooth the path when we understand that the delivery systems that we have are the delivery systems that will most likely be in place, especially because of the financing and complexity around that. So I think that you know you look at the next uh, waiver, you look at the next uh, approach that California is taking, and we've already kind of started to look onto the horizon and say, how are we doing um, a better job not only beyond whole person care, but you know we've kind of got some larger care coordination discussions that have been happening um, within our stakeholder process because we're looking to the next waiver and we're saying, what is it that we can continue to do to improve um, the care that we're providing to these uh, Californians that are you know currently in the Medi-Cal program? So with that, I thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Thanks. Let me start with uh, probably the hardest question of all, but each of you brought up behavioral health as elements of what we need to do to get from here to closer alignment. Oh, and I was told we're not speaking closely enough into the microphone. That's why people are having a hard time hearing. So I'm going to model that behavior. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear it come up for all of you. And no one has figured it out. But each of you made reference to the key role it plays. And I just wonder if you could go a little deeper in thinking about uh, what the next steps are. It's a fairly broad question, but I, it, it, uh, it, it cries out for attention. So who wants to take the... Brad, you mentioned it as, yeah. at the end of your comments. So I mean, a couple thoughts. I mean, one is you have to serve people where they are. So I'll give you an example. Um, and some people have heard this example before. 52-year-old schizophrenic, ex-meth user, ex-heroin user, clean. Go, takes two to three buses every day to go to a, uh, basically a day treatment center, doing very well. Hemoglobin A1C 12.1, not so good. Probably gonna die early of his diabetes, and there's a lot of data that if you have a serious mental illness and a concomitant medical condition, you die 20 years too, too young. So you have to deliver the care where they are, which was the theory behind our pilot, was deliver the primary care where he goes every day for his substance use treatment, and really a day treatment, really a support group at the bottom line, or in a primary care setting, don't say, oh, you have a behavioral health issue, why don't you go over there? We'll, we'll tell you where it is, we'll give you a phone number. No, deliver as much as you can in that primary care center, and you can't deliver it all. We've got the relationship with our counties for the seriously mentally ill that we do very well with, and so you can't deliver it all in the primary care setting, but you can deliver a lot. So to me, Alan, it's how do we figure out how to put these two things together in terms of physical location and then ultimately coordinating the care across 
behavioral health and physical health. And so that, that to me is one model. We do behavioral health directly at IEHP. We don't use a vendor, so it gives us tremendous flexibility. But that has worked for us when our FQHCs can deliver the physical health and the behavioral health to a point, and then we engage our counties to, you know, around people that are more seriously mentally ill. I mean, I think um, I, I would agree with what Brad said. When we look at our data around high cost users in our population, um, especially on the um, kind of the inner uh, exchange between serious mental illness um, and any other kind of health condition, our top, you know, 1%, um, they have up to 10 conditions, um, including serious mental illness. Um, they usually cost, on average, um, you know, between two and three hundred thousand dollars a year, um, because they're using um, services across various delivery systems, not including the managed care side. I think what we are really trying to do, and this is um, this is just a personal opinion, but um, there's not an app and there's not a technology to help people with serious mental illness that everybody seems to be struggling with. Is oftentimes people come in and say, "Oh, I can, you know, data analytics, you know, your." population, I can give you an app to help manage your seriously mental ill, and I'm like, I don't actually know that that's the best case for some of these populations. They are truly um, some of the most fragile and the most um, incapable of navigating the system for themselves, and sometimes you have to just acknowledge that that requires a person, right? You need a human to help that person navigate, and that's not an app. It's not a phone number, it's not a call center, it's not a case manager that sits and proactively uh, just kind of sits around and waits for that person to call and be proactive in their own care. And so, you know, when we have really kind of tried to unpack the data around CalMedi Connect with the duels, um, that has all kind of the most successful cases that we have seen have been the plans that have um, proactively dispatched real humans um, that are trained and skilled um, at helping those individuals get to appointments, to do follow-up care, to make sure that they're eating, taking their medication. And I think that when we look at the what has been a fairly uh, okay performance on some of the seriously mentally ill is we have kind of abandoned some of the true um, just human to human personal contact, um, just because of you know either size or capacity expertise. There's a lot of reasons why, but I think that our key as a state to continuing to kind of help solve that um, both population and that problem um, is now kind of going back into the old fashioned way of just doing one on one care. W women with substance use. Uh, or, or major mental illness are major drivers of poor pregnancy outcome. No question about that. Uh, the opportunity is that during pregnancy you have uh, probably the most intense uh, relationships with providers that you may have in your life. Uh, seeing a, a, a provider every, every two weeks to four weeks for a long period of time. The problem is it's not coordinated. Uh, because, and it is a, a window only. And so the opportunity that we see is the coordination of that care with longer term providers of substance use or mental health. Because during pregnancy, women have the greatest incentive to seek care that they do at any other point because obviously of concern uh, for their pregnancy outcome. Uh, and so that's leverage that we have. And I think with the new bills that the governor has signed, the new money coming into the states for opioids, uh, that we have real opportunities to take that episode and, and for women in reproductive age range and, and make an impact. Let me just follow up on that, uh, tying back to our first conversation this morning about accountability and measures. Yep. There's a tendency for obvious reasons to build those measures around relatively high frequency uh, uh, events around things that have a, a, a fairly clear clinical pathway. Um, what what you dis each of you describe in very different ways, a very high touch, a, a particularly disadvantaged complex population, don't lend themselves to these broad metrics. Um, so I'm wondering how in a world where we're pushing for accountability we do both, or can we do both, or how do we balance, you can take this wherever you want, the notion of controlling uh, uh, blood pressure or uh, glucose levels with 
taking the 25 most expensive people and really taking apart what's going on in their lives. These are, they, they feel very different to me, but we need to do both. So how, how do we send the right signals? How do we build systems that are a, a, capable of, of both of those kinds of interventions? I mean, Jeff kind of, Jeff said it this morning when, when uh, the woman from Children's Partnership talked about children, and it is a real, it is a real conundrum. We want standardized sets of measures so we can compare across populations. But those tend to be, and I don't mean this the way it's going to sound, but tend to be to some extent lowest common denominator in the sense of it doesn't take into account the really complex populations that need the, the human touch to make a difference. So to me, as a plan, I think about both. I say I've got to do the measure sets, I've got to do those measures, I have to make sure I've got pay for performance and activities related to those. Well, then I have to have these special programs or projects that focus on very distinct populations. Individuals in long-term care that don't need to be there that have nowhere to go. Waste of money, horrible place to live, bad quality of life. I want to get them out into the community. So all the resources necessary to do that. I can measure that on a cost basis. It's definitely better quality of life for that individual. Maybe better from a, you know, from a medical point of view. So I think, I think, Alan, you have to do both. You have to say, okay, we're going to have to have standard measures. We're going to have to measure those things. And then, for example, I mean, we just added a hospital pay for performance around C-section. So we're, we're kind of taking Elliot's work and trying to drive, you know, create financial motivations to do that. That's not a measure that's anywhere. I mean, other than all the work Elliot's done, that's not a standard measure in any data set. So we're just going to have to do those things as a plan to make a difference for our populations. I don't know any other way to do it. So we actually made that measure in t through NQF, and it's a joint commission measure in m many other places. So it, it did come from somewhere. Uh, but the uh, you know, value-based payment is coming to obstetrics, uh, but it has to be at the two levels. Uh, the, you know, I think we, we are indebted to Cover California for really engaging the plans uh, at, a, at a very high level uh, to look at maternity care with some specific metrics, like, like uh, low risk first birth C-section. Uh, but also, uh, we, do, we have been working with an 1115 waiver for the Medicaid population to, uh, to incent implementation of safety measures at hospitals. Uh, and that's really been a big, big push. Uh, and that really gets the, the low frequency, high risk events. Uh, and this is something that's actually uh, now, I was in DC earlier this week, uh, is being looked on nationally with some of the major payers and CMS as a way to go because maternal mortality is a national issue now, as if you've been following the news. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, having, having criteria for implementation of safety measures will be uh, 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 coming down the pike in a lot of our plans. I would only say that uh, from where we stand as a department, when people come and want to talk about data analysis, right? Like you did an intervention, you did an initiative, you did a program, did it work? Um, we struggle um, in many cases around just the uh, both availability and accessibility of data. So I can go to Brad's uh, plan, which we do a lot, um, and we pull charts and we pull data and we say, how are you doing on these encounters? Let's look at your HEDIS scores. We'll pull, and they have to go to their providers and pull data. I think sometimes when you start to do these kind of cross um, aggregated kind of data sources, it gets a lot more complicated very quickly. So like on the ODS waiver, one of the big pushes that people are interested to see is when you're providing this new substance use treatment delivery system for individuals, what does it do on um, recidivism? Uh, what does it do on your jail and incarceration rates? Well, those aren't data pieces that I would otherwise necessarily capture in my department. And how you, how you try to do some of those kind of larger analyses really get very complicated very quickly. Um, and then to Brad's um, example, which I remember, um, is if you ask the mental health uh, department about that patient that he referenced, they'd be like, we knocked that thing out of the park. That guy is doing fantastic. And he'd go up on the, on the board as being like a success case because their data would show that he actually was successful. He's clean, he's sober, he's attending treatment. His you know, mental health issues have been seriously ameliorated, but he's a mess on the physical health side. So you also have to kind of remember that when we start to measure, um, again, we are in systems no matter 
whether we like it or not, it's sometimes um, a little disingenuous to look at the physical health side, look at that data and say, this is great. But then on the mental health side, you look and go, well, that's not really the same story or vice versa. And then if you start to get multiple systems in place, the actual analysis of that is very, very complicated. Let's take a few questions from you all. Again, uh, the very back here, let's get a microphone to you. and. Stand, identify yourself so we can all hear, and speak directly into the microphone. It's better when it's on. That working better? All right, there we you. go. All right, uh, Richard Pan, the local Medi-Cal pediatrician, former uh, health services researcher <laughs> at UC Davis. Um, my, I'm telling the more important and, stuff. And, and um, humble. Yeah. <laughs> Um, not, not telling your real story. There you go. go. Well, that is the real story, actually, uh, in relation to this question. Uh, so uh, I appreciate that we're focusing on, actually, uh, in this area and also about integration versus um, consolidation. But I guess my question has to do with, um, uh, so as policymakers, oftentimes, uh, sometimes we treat um, providers as widgets, all right? So, you know, your pediatrician, any other pediatrician could do the same job, or a primary care doctor, et cetera, right? Uh, but what I'm hearing from the stories presented here, and certainly there's uh, research uh, from Barbara Starfield who studied primary care, that the part about primary care that actually gets the quality improvements and cost savings is the relationship between the physician and the patient, right? The ongoing relationship, right? And we actually, there's some data on uh, like uh, 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 basically uh, uh, wasted care or you know, duplication uh, that uh, it shows that that's a major part of sort of uh, overutilization. So I guess my question is, how do we uh, and, uh, capture the value of continuity? Because what happens is that, right, we have a system where there's a new Medi-Cal contract with a, well, if it's a COS, it's going to be the same, but different plan, or they have different networks. And so people get swapped in and out, providers get swapped in and out, uh, who now have to relearn uh, new sets of patients, uh, at least a portion of them. And so how do we capture the value of continuity and, pri and put that in, whether it's price-wise or quality-wise, uh, into our systems as we talk about integration of care? Thanks, Dr. Pan. As a physician, I, I agree with you. But I also think that it, it needs to be a team. I mean, I think it's not just the physician. I think it's the physician plus, in our case, you know, the nurse, the social worker, LMFT, or the care coordinator who work as a team, because you, you know the doc can't do it all, and they shouldn't do it all, and they're not necessarily as good at it as, as everything. So to me, to your point, I mean, the good news is in the Inland Empire, we have 90% of the membership, so I don't really care who the other plan is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, your point is well taken, though, is it's not helpful for a member to lose that care team at all. I mean, whether it's the care team of the nurse and the social worker that they've bonded with, or the care coordinator that they bonded with, and hopefully, of course, the physician that they've bonded with. And so we actually, the way we address that is we assign to the physician. We don't assign to the group. We don't assign to the IPA. We actually assign to the, our members to that individual physician. And that, I think, helps to create that connection. And, and we try to work very hard at keeping that continuity because, you know, to, to the points that have been made, it's not just the data. It's not just the reporting of the hemoglobin A1C. It's you know, their knowledge of their housing situation, their knowledge of their relationships, their knowledge and their knowledge being the team of their caregivers. That's all part of that continuity, let alone the medical continuity of, you know, familiarity with the patient's condition. So totally agree with you. I would say the key is to make it that team, the continuity with the team, um, but, but completely agree. And so the way to do that is, is you know, for the plan and the providers to, to keep those relationships and not you know, switch and change and, you know, sort of flavor of the month type thing. I think I'd like to add a little bit more about the engagement and coordination between the provider and the patient, the woman herself in my setting. Uh, and I think that's, that's an area that can be improved greatly uh, in a number of our settings. Uh, and I think uh, the recent project from CHCF on listening to mothers, for example, really shows a lot of opportunities for improvement. Uh, we've done a coordinated project on My Birth Matters, uh, again, trying to get women to talk with their physicians and, and jointly come up with their birth preferences. 
Uh, and, and that's a, a, often a missing piece uh, in good practices that can work, but it's, we really want that for every, every practice and every care. So that's a care coordination that I think is a critical one as well. How about we do one more question? I know there's a lot to cover, but I think we can fit one more in. I... Thank you. Gail Matthew from the California Dental Association. Dr. Gilbert, I'm interested, curious, if when you were doing the wide group of assessments on your members, if you looked at oral health, if you thought about linking them to oral health services when you were looking at the whole person there? You know, that's a good question. Um, as a physician, we're pathetic about, I mean, we're pathetic about oral health. I mean, we are. We're not trained. We don't understand it. You know, we, we basically say, go see your dentist. I mean, so I would have to go back and look. I don't think we addressed it specifically. There was a global questionnaire. Part, we have that global questionnaire, and I don't know if it includes, you know, dental or oral health needs there. Um, so I'll have to check, but it's a, it's a really good point because that's, if they can't eat, if they're having trouble, you know, ingesting or being able to eat because of, their, um, because of what their mouth is like, then you're not going to get anywhere either. So it's yet another factor that could in fact, Im uh, impact their health. Thanks. That was so quick we could fit one more. In. <laughs> if it's that quick. Got you in the back here. Um, I'm, a, I'm actually a Medi-Cal beneficiary, and um, I guess um, I probably fit in the upper 1%. I have chronic medical conditions, and um, I really appreciate your um, points about um, including the patient, and I think the patient should be part of the team, too, that you mentioned, Brad. Um, and um, one thing that I've noticed lately in the changes in the healthcare system that kind of might impact this is the move to electronic medical records and health information exchanges. When patients lose their continuity of care, I've recently had like um, my main um, oncologist um, retire and I've had to look for um, other doctors. Um, it's like um, I've noticed that um, the doctors want to talk to each other in the for the, you know, for the benefit of like integrating my care, um, but um, they don't ask me for my medical records, they don't ask me for my input and everything, and I think it leads to bad medical care, and it also leads to, um, I guess, um, inefficient care, where I go to appointments and um, I get nothing out of them, and it doesn't like lead to any progress. So something needs to, I think, you know, that needs to be addressed too, how to really get the patient more involved um, and understand that the patient voice really is very important in the whole situation because all this data that people are analyzing really comes from, the, from what's going on with the patient. So, wow, thanks so much for coming and making that comment. It kind of reminds us all. So one of the things that was true of the team, if you read some of the quotes in the paper, that, that was that, that true feeling of the patient, the member as we call them, connecting to that team and really feeling like they were part of it. So really good point, which is why we specifically assessed how does the member, feel, we call the members, feel about you know, this whole scenario and situation. Your other comment about transfer of data, absolutely critical, very pathetic that in our today's world we can't e easily transfer information from one treating practitioner to another. Working on it, lots of work being done in that area, um, but really sad that I can stick my ATM card into a bank slot and they know everything about me instantly. Nothing like that in the healthcare field. So thank you, very, very important comments. Okay, I think i uh, ask you to join me in thanking our panelists here as we move to our final. We're going to move seamlessly to our last uh, presenters here. You're going to hear from uh, Richard Scheffler, Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Health Economics and Public Policy at the School of Public Health and the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Betsy Imholz, Special Projects Director of Consumers Union, the nonprofit publisher of Consumer Reports. Tom Prislak, President and CEO of Cedar sinai Health System and, uh, and Cedar sinai itself. So. As we get the names up, we'll move quickly into our presentation, so we have a little bit of time for conversation. Richard, I'll turn it first to you. Well, thank you, Alan, and for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, I am a New Yorker, so I understand your Steinberg metaphor. 
of Ninth Avenue, but uh, this is California, and uh, just remember, California was the first state to allow a red turn on right, uh, a right turn on red. So this is an innovative place. <laughs> the next innovation you're going to see is we uh, are, I think, to use a over, overused phrase at the tipping point of uh, integrated care models. Uh, as people have pointed out, uh, data matters. Uh, by 2016, data that's put out uh, by the Secretary of Health and Healthy California says that 62% of the uh, doctor and the are in a healthcare system that's an integrated model. On top of that, you asked why not Kaiser, why hasn't Kaiser grown? Kaiser has grown. It's 30% uh, of the market. I would claim that Kaiser could have been 50 or 60% of the market, but they in fact were worried about antitrust and regulation. And uh, the Kaiser model of determining their premiums, since I work with them and my students, is they decide what premium, uh, how many new members they want, and then they set their premium because they know they're a cost-effective system. And so they could have uh, grown much more quickly uh, than they did. But we have new HMOs coming in California. Uh, Blue Shield has 800,000. Anthem has 600,000. United has 500,000 and growing rapidly. Hospital systems like Sutter and others are developing HMO products. Uh, we are clearly at the tipping point. Just as uh, Jeff Rideout has been speaking on this topic, I uh, did speak at the RAND meeting, but over the weekend was the keynote speaker, believe it or not, at the California Medical Association. When I first got the invite, being an economist, I thought it was one of that fake news kind of things you get on the email. And, but no, uh, and I decided to do it. And no, I wasn't booed out. They had actually uh, understood that the integrated care model was coming. And they asked me to speak about it. I did get an hour then, not seven minutes. And uh, it was based on a report that I did with my good friend and colleague, Steve Shortell. We co-chaired the Berkeley Forum. And then basically they had read it and said, uh, this makes a lot of sense to us. So they see the handwriting on the wall. And so I could go on and on with this and give you other things that would make the case that uh, Ninth Avenue and Washington is about to see an integrated care delivery model in California. I think that's the big, that's the big aha. Uh -huh. Then you asked me in an email to kind of talk about why consolidation has happened. And uh, so I'm going to share some thoughts on that. First, let me tell you that the entire economy in the United States is consolidating. It's just not the healthcare sector. It's just not the banking sector. It is virtually every big sector in our economy. You can Google the Council of Economic Advisors report within the last six months, and you can see this. And they take it as a threat to competition, capitalism, and to some extent, our way of life. <laughs> this is a big deal. And what's going on in healthcare in California, which was my paper, which I'll go through at the end very quickly, is, has gone on throughout the entire United States. This is not a California phenomenon on consolidation. So quickly, because I see the clock going, consolidation happened in healthcare specifically because I think in part the, the ACA. Lots of money pumped into the healthcare system and lots of hospitals with money going after a huge influx of capital. Capital meaning more spending, more people enrolled. They saw this as a business opportunity and it clearly was and still is. Secondly, 
ACOs. A uh, big push from the federal government for ACOs, I think for good reasons, and I'm a big supporter of integrated delivery systems. But it put a veil over all sorts of other purchasers uh, going on both vertical, we call it buying hospitals, buying physicians and others, and horizontal put a, a stop on it. There was no challenge at all by states and particularly the federal government, Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission. I work with them on an ongoing basis uh, as a director of the Petra Center. Virtually none of these were challenged because the notion was let the system consolidate a little bit for efficiencies and let it integrate with, a, uh, with ACOs and other forms of integration. So it was open season. Now we're seeing the result of that, and some of it is quite good. Some of it is mixed, as Jeff pointed out. And some of it is just downright bad. Price increases rapidly, particularly in the hospital system, but in the healthcare system in general. Uh, Chris Welly talked about some of that and way beyond the wages of American workers. So, with my 45 seconds, I want to thank the California Healthcare Foundation for supporting this work. This is the big aha. So, if you look at the lines at the top, that's the horizontal hospitals, insurance companies, specialists. That's been very, very high, and it's been uh, going on, uh, it's pretty flat over 2010, 2016. This isn't my health affairs paper, there's a lot more detail in it. But the big aha in California is that red dotted line where the specialists are being essentially, uh, their practices through foundations, which is what we have in California, being bought up by the hospitals. So now you have a situation where over half the specialists in California are uh, specialist practices through foundations are owned by hospitals. This is the biggest dramatic change in the healthcare system in the 36 years I've been here and teaching at Berkeley. This will change it dramatically. And some of these are being looked at quite seriously. Here are some of the big ones, the dignity of course, is still going on, and I don't have time to go through the rest of those, but there's been huge numbers of them happening. This produces, and this is my last point, this produces uh, a combination, a multiplier effect. So on a concentrated market with hospitals, it's highly concentrated, and it buys physician practices, the multiplier effect on their price and negotiation skyrockets. So you can see the red line. Chris Whaley knows this well because he was a co-author of my paper. And I forget if you made the red line or, or Dan Arnold who was the other uh, co-author. So we're seeing something that is going to dramatically change and drive the healthcare system. And this is only the price effect. This is on ACA premiums. We also looked at it for, for uh, outpatient visits. This is dramatic. And so, on the one hand, we want integrated delivery systems. We're definitely going to have them in California. The financing matters. And we have to put these two stories together to make sure we still have a dynamic, competitive system where patients still have some choices to make. <laughs> and there is some incentive for these large delivery systems, which we're having and we're going to have even more in the future, to have some incentives to perform better, as Jeff has shown you, and also uh, to deliver value for their cost. Thank you very much. Fighting a little froggy throat, so I'll bring my water with me. Um, Betsy M. Holtz from Consumers Union, which is the advocacy arm of Consumer Reports. 
I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a lapsed Californian. I'm, a, I'm an adopted or adoptee Californian. I'm also from New York, Richard, but I've been here 28 years, so by now I think I'm a Californian. California has made some great strides in improving access to coverage, as we all know, and improving quality as well as the Maternal uh, Quality Project has illustrated. Um, and in terms of integrated care, as Professor uh, Scheffler's paper, paper points out, 60% of healthcare in California is now delivered. Um, through either fully or highly integrated uh, care. So we, we're making a lot of progress, and for a lot of Californians, care is more affordable. Yet as these papers illustrate, um, for some Californians, there's still a great struggle. People are bedeviled by the high prices of coverage um, and care. And competition as a tool for better quality and lower prices is falling short. Um, Kaiser Family Foundation poll from uh, September showed unexpected medical bills, in fact, at the top of the list of consumer concerns, above worries about rent and mortgages, utilities, everything else. So it's still an ongoing concern, uh, obviously for some consumers more than others. Consumers are not a monolithic group, I should just acknowledge. But the fears are justified as healthcare coverage and care strains many family budgets. And it's not all due to consolidation, obviously. Um, but it is an important factor for us to worry about and focus on. The major driver of insurance premiums, um, as we know, is the research consistently shows, is the uh, prices charged by providers. Prices typically set through negotiation between insurers on the one hand, hospitals and physicians on the other. Um, and the increased market power um, that providers have uh, developed um, from the consolidations we've seen in recent years allows them to get higher prices, therefore higher premiums, and to impose some anti-competitive uh, contract terms, uh, which is getting a lot, of, uh, a lot of notice lately. Through consumers' unions' rate review work over the past several years, um, we've seen the growing gap, as, as you all have as well, uh, between the premiums in Northern and Southern California. The most glaring example uh, for this year, Region 9, Monterey, and Environs, uh, for 2019, we'll see a weighted average increase of about 16%, double the statewide average. And sort of gr gr greater provider uh, concentration in turn fuels, of course, um, insurer consolidation. And then we have the arms race continuing. Um, I think the Aetna CVS merger approved last week is going to fuel this conversation, the continuing conversation about consolidation and the role it will play in our healthcare system. Generally, consumers' unions' position um, is that competition grounded in consumer choice works best for consumers. Um, when consumers have meaningful choices, the plans and other actors involved are motivated to provide more affordability, um, better choices, meaningful choices, and better quality service and better, better quality products. Um, but we do have a current environment in California where we have pockets where there is not that much plan, for example, plan uh, competition and choice. In fact, a third of the California zip codes in Covered California in 2018 um, had two or fewer plan choices. And 213 zip codes in Holler and Port had just one plan choice. So the legislatures recognize this. Um, these concerns about limited plan choice with two bills um, enacted this year, both uh, authored by uh, Assembly Health Chair Jim Wood, AB 595 requiring Knox Keen plans intending to merge or consolidate or enter into agreements that would um, uh, result in their control by another entity to be approved by the Department of Managed Health Care. And I know Shelley's over here. We're going to look to Shelley to make those good reviews, have public meetings on them, and get an independent analysis of those transactions and what the impact will be on California. The other one is AB 2472, exploring a public option. Um, it's been suggested that there's a tension between consolidation um, and competition. And on the surface, that does seem true. But we, we also know that you don't have to have financial and legal consolidation uh, or mergers in order to coordinate care. Clinical coordination can happen through other means, contracts and otherwise. Um, the clock is ticking, so I'm going to try to get down to this. Um, I would just make two, two points in closing. Um, we all know that the public policy process, not just in California, but everywhere, is a messy one. And it doesn't all happen in the order we might like. 
um, mergers can be approved without considering all the implications, the real world implications for consumers or other policy decisions may be made. For example, Glenn Melnick's paper talks about um, uh, the prudent layperson standard being imposed in California, which is a great thing for consumers, super important. California standard, by the way, better than other states on this. A reasonable person getting access to emergency care is critical. But what wasn't addressed right away was balanced billing for consumers, so the impact on consumers. We took care of it later on through a court case. But these are the kinds of things that have to all be thought about together, it's the real, including the real impact on consumers. And, and perhaps this new AB 595 will allow the Department of Managed Care to do some of that and give it a little more power um, on its approval process. A second closing point is um, if consolidation trends continue, consumers may need regulatory controls on prices uh, to counter market forces. If we can't stop consolidation, uh, we may need that. Now we know given the outcry um, this year when the California bill that would have imposed some price setting um, uh, was heard in the legislature that there was a public outcry. Understandable. It's un-American to have price control. But we need to do something. And um, we know it's a battle that would be hard fought, but clearly the quest for cost saving and better medical outcomes, better health for Californians, uh, requires um, some safeguards around consolidation. Um, California's leadership in the right direction uh, for consumers depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. There's what's left of the morning. Peter, uh, Alan, Peter, and Sandra, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think we all agree it's a complicated and nuanced issue. Hopefully my comments will add to all of our understanding of, of this important topic. Let me just state the obvious in the beginning, whether, and that is that physicians and hospitals in California, whether they're part of integrated systems economically or not, all have the same concern that all of us in the room have about both the cost and quality. I would observe that um, Economically and clinically integrated systems, I believe, are essential to getting the 21st century healthcare system that, that we want. Um, and also that the um, economically and clinically integrated model itself is not inherently inflationary. Um, and with great admiration and respect for the kind of work that Richard and others in the field do, fundamentally there are, ser there are significant limits uh, to the ability of analyzing such a complex question. And I think the, the data help, is helpful, but I think not determinative about this matter. Uh, the, reason, the real issue behind both the healthcare cost increase and price has to do with the input costs to the healthcare system, both on the labor side and the supply side, um, and how those, how those factors play out in different in institutions and organizations varies. Um, the other aspect that can't be overlooked is what the organization does and who they serve. Uh, because at the end of the day, commercial prices reflect both of those facts. And those are the kind of things that actually are what is driving healthcare cost increase. Uh, it's not leverage in the marketplace as is being suggested. There are, in fact, studies out there that demonstrate uh, the effectiveness of both economically and clini clinically integrated systems, and that they're not inflationary, and they do uh, contribute to reducing the important administrative cost, the overhead, the administrative burden in the American healthcare system. And actually, here in, in California, if you look at the data for the last five years, and you look at the net commercial revenue per adjusted discharge paid to, hosp to hospitals in California. Uh, the lead, some of the leading integrated systems, clinically and economically, in California are actually doing better than the statewide average in controlling uh, the increase in healthcare costs. And then finally, Kaiser's already been mentioned. And if I, have, I must say that for those of us involved in healthcare delivery, we find it remarkably ironic that the most completely integrated system in the state and in the country uh, uh, exists at a time when one is questioning whether moving in that direction is a good idea or not. In order to do uh, effective, high-quality, cost-efficient care, there are a couple of things that are necessary. 
It takes people with talent. It takes systems, care systems, not just IT systems. It takes clinical and management leadership. It takes shared vision and aligned interests across a variety of constituencies. It takes capital, and it, and it takes the ability to implement at scale. That defines what are economically and clinically integrated systems. And I think it was represented, frankly, uh, in Jeff's data early today, where in that data, eight of the leading clinically and economically integrated systems in the state are present. What was also mentioned earlier today is the work done in San Diego, where they reduced the incidence of AMI by 22% hospitalizations compared to 8% for the rest of the state. I would suggest that San Diego is one of, if not the most consolidated place in the state. And I'd just like to suggest to you that that would have never happened had it not been for the economically and clinically integrated systems that exist there. There's just no way you can overcome the inertia of trying to organize thousands of physicians, which is what it is, and hundreds, uh, tens, tens of hospitals at least, if not over 100, uh, that would have been operating individually. Uh, lastly, uh, before some closing observation, I just say I think we need to recognize we are still in the midst of the transition of a system that built up over 50 years. And we should remain impatient for moving more quickly um, and moving farther. Um, but also, I think we need to have an appreciation for what it means to re reconfigure 20% of the American economy while we're fly flying the plane, by the way, which is the additional complicator. It's relevant for this discussion for a couple of reasons, one of which is that the uh, time period used to assess both the horizontal and vertical integration reflects um, both the delivery of integrated care, but also the old model as well. And I don't think we should overlook that. Markets are fluid and dynamic, and I think using the available data to make the decisions is really somewhat akin to looking in the rearview mirror while you're trying to drive down the highway. To wrap up, I do think that appropriate steps should be taken when it comes to avoiding inappropriate leverage by any partner, whether it's a health plan, physicians, integrated systems, it doesn't matter. I think there are tools available to do that. And I think it's important to remember there's a difference between determining um, individual cases versus trying to make a policy level decision about how the system can benefit from being organized in a different way. Some quick suggested solutions in my last 15 seconds, not overreaching and preventing the development of integrated systems, uh, creative effective mechanisms that factor in public policy considerations <laughs> that impact both the, the cost as well as the delivery of the system, and addressing what I think are important steps to level the playing field where needed and to address the policy matters that end up resulting in misguided efforts to uh, try to control costs that end up really hurting patients because it, it really negatively affects available services in a community and also negatively affects a well-functioning uh, commercial insurance market. Thank you. I have a feeling we could effectively spend an entire day on this topic, and I don't think we're going to. Ed. Yes. And I know we would ask to speak. And uh, we're not going to resolve it here, but let me just push a little bit to, to some questions on my mind. I'll just start with the, the, the dumb analyst at the end of the table here who says, I read this report from the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, that says 30% of what we spend is waste, has, provides no value to patients. If you can give me a model that takes that 30% out, I can afford your salaries and your profits because 30% would give me a whole lot of money. If you were doing that, I would see closed hospitals, I would see clinicians moving to other states, I would see you know, layoffs of administrative staff, uh, although this is the clinical side. I'm not seeing it, so what Who's, who's going to give that to me? How, how do I get my hands on that 30% which then makes a lot of these other issues go away? Is this microphone on? <laughs> wow, I was waiting for that chance. So uh, the report uh, is an important report and, uh, and some work uh, that Steve Chirotel and I are doing now on reforming the California healthcare system. Uh, 
We looked at it in California, and of course the two biggest items in that are administrative costs and duplication. And I would say that a, an integrated model deals with both of those directly on. Uh, administrative costs, you don't have to give your life's story every time you see a doctor and find out what prescriptions and where it is and all of that. And duplication of services doesn't happen at Kaiser because they have the record and they know that you've gotten that scan before and you're not going to get another one this week no matter what you do. So uh, I'm a big supporter of the integrated model. Uh, I think Tom's comments are just on. Uh, this paper is on data in 2016 and we need to look forward. And that's why Jeff and I, Jeff Ryder and I, have decided we're going to continue to work with Steve and look at the integrated model. And uh, it's not one size fits all. I mean, I totally agree with you. Uh, we're going to try to find out what size is the right size for California. And I think that database does it. But let me make it one point absolutely clear. California's prices depend on market power and market con concentration. Another Petra study that the Attorney General used, we clearly show that prices are 30 percent higher in, in Northern California than Southern California. And that's adjusting for wages, anything else you want, Tom. And also, in Jeff's data, you find the same thing in integrated systems that use the total cost of care, not just prices, the total cost of care, you find the same North-South difference. So the answer is, Fix this market or do something with it and make it work and make it better. Or as Betsy has said, look forward to price regulation uh, happening at the state level. So uh, you get to choose and the legislature gets to choose <laughs> and the new governor gets to choose. I just say quickly, I agree with just most everything Richard said. Um, and we're a big fan of integrated systems as well. We see it in the quality measures generally um, that integrated systems do better. Well, the one point I wanted to go back to, though, on, on saving on duplication is, is the HIT, health information technology. Um, and incredibly frustrating, all the money that has been put into it in the United States. And the comment earlier today from the um, Medi-Cal beneficiary in the back, the, the woman who made some excellent comments, we should be able to avoid the duplication, um, although the incentives are probably wrong in a, in a non-integrated system, by having interoperable, good quality um, health information technology. But that said, it seems like a very frustrating and fruitless path to that. I'm, I'm not giving up, but it's another way we could save on those wasted costs. Hit the button. Hit that button. There, there we go. That's, That's better. new technology for you. Yeah, yeah. Right. exact technologies work when the operator knows how to use it. Right. Um, so a just a couple observations. So the issue, I mean, the uh, the issue about overutilization in the traditional American healthcare system, having watched that for 45 years now, 40 of it in California, I agree completely, and I agreed when it first came out. Um, I, I would just I would just observe a couple of things. Number one, with regard to solving that problem. I do think that integrated systems are the way, the only way that that, in fact, will will get done. Um, it, it, the overutilization has come about because of the way that the system has historically been organized and paid for, which is another, I guess, the other point I'd like to emphasize, um, and that is that um, a lot of the efforts to try to control spending and deal with the unavoidable duplication. There are a lot of payment models that have come out. Reference pricing was mentioned uh, earlier. Reference pricing can give pe some people comfort, and don't get me wrong, lowering the cost of the everything is a good idea. But I don't think it should be confused with reducing the total cost of the system. Because at the end of the day, institutions reduce their prices to, be, to meet those kind of markets, but the underlying cost of the system remains. And so you have to get at the underlying drivers of the cost as part of it. And then the last comment, and this is where the, this is where the original data on overutilization and demand forecasts, I think, is a little out of date. And that is all of that was based pre-ACA. And the reality is, thank God, the ACA has made health care available to a lot more people. So what was, what's not been discussed a lot over the years, besides overutilization, 
has been under utilization because of limits on access. And so uh, the reality is healthcare spending in the country is going to continue to be under pressure as people appropriately make use of care they need. And for many of those people, unfortunately, they haven't received it over the years. There, I hear a lot of agreement on the value of, of integration. Betsy sort of quickly tossed out the notion that clinical integration doesn't need to depend entirely on financial integration. Um, again, this is a complex topic, but I'd be interested in the reactions of uh, uh, the others of you and Betsy, if you want to go further on whether that really is true or if the, the ultimate benefits of clinical integration are dependent in the end on, on some level or maybe total level of uh, financial integration. Tom, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I, 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 as, as you heard in my comments, I, I do believe that um, economic integration as well as clinical integration is vitally important. Um, and I say that for a couple of reasons, some of which I've mentioned. Uh, one is um, achieving what it is we want to, want to achieve requires significant capital investment. Re-engineering and reconfiguring the American healthcare system is not cheap, and it's even more expensive in California. In order for that to occur, um, people need to know that they are going to have stable partners. And again, I point to Kaiser as an example of that for the last 50 plus years. Um, secondly, the, the um, uh, goodwill alone, as much as we all may want to believe it is, that it is the solution to a lot of things, and it is, um, when it comes to this topic and the capital requirement, the cultural change evolution required by both hospitals and physicians and everyone in the delivery system, those things only come about because people are committed and it's just very difficult to get the necessary commitment to get the change necessary without both economic and clinical alignment. Having said that, and, and again to repeat a little of what I said in my remarks, at the end of the day, outlier behavior, whether that's by health plans or integrated systems or anybody, is an issue that deserves attention. But there's a fundamental difference between how one goes about uh, dealing with outlier behavior and policy decisions and how, you, and how you make policy decisions to design the system more broadly. Well, picking up on uh, Betsy's very uh, good idea and insight, uh, so you can integrate uh, without buying up all the physicians and pharmacies and everything else by having a series of contracts. And the contract can be as long as you want it to be. It can be five years rolling. It can be 10 years rolling. And if you have a five or 10 year contract with a partner, that's pretty good dependability. But it does allow you to get out. And, and, and it does allow the healthcare system to breathe. Uh, and you're not in control of uh, the hospital that might buy you or the healthcare system that buy, might buy you. So I'm, I do think that that's a possibility uh, and that we ought to look at seriously. There have been cases, I'm, I do antitrust work, I won't bore you with all of them, but there have been cases decided by judges that say, we're not going to let this hospital buy these primary care groups. We prefer them to do it on contracts because if they do, they have bought up the entire market because the primary care doctors are the referral patterns in that area. And if this hospital or healthcare system has the referral patterns, they essentially have the healthcare system and competition and choice disappears uh, immediately. So that's the big concern uh, in the antitrust literature is called shutting out your rivals. <laughs> if they don't get referrals, you shut them out of the market. And that is one of the real concerns. Kaiser doesn't have this concern because it has its, it's both a delivery system and a financing system. And it's a slightly different kind of model than a hospital buying physician practices and then negotiating with an insurance company. It's a wholly different environment and market. As you say, there's a lot of details. I don't have time to go into them. But I do think there are other ways, and importantly, these other ways have to figure out how to get rural doctors in part of this. And, uh, you know, one way is for them to, uh, they don't have the capital. <laughs> I talk about capital requirements. They don't have the money to do this. The state can help them and others can help them uh, by 
providing some money, and I do think that would be a good idea. Um, but they're threatened, and these rural hospitals are threatened, so they join the healthcare system because they're being driven out of business, quite frankly. Uh, even the physicians in their community uh, end up being bought up by the hospitals and healthcare system and refer them to places outside their area. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Uh, I can tell you I get constant calls from uh, venture capitalists that want to talk to me and big money, um, banking system. People know this is going on. Uh, I won't talk to them, no matter what the fee is, and the fee is, can be considerable. But, um, um, you know, I do okay at UC. I'm not rich, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> so big money knows about this, and they're after it. And so this is the same thing that's driven the entire economy, which is essentially our banking system and our venture capital system, which has eventually bought up the entire industries across the entire country, out inside healthcare and outside healthcare. Any more yeah, no, on just uh, to, to add to uh, Professor Scheffler's remark, I mean, that is what the court in, um, in Idaho in the St. Luke's case did, exactly, unwinding a vertical, um, a vertical consolidation by saying, do it in another way. There's other ways to achieve the same end. Well, that was the St. Louis case. Uh, so um, how many Berkeley students are here or graduates? Raise your hands. So I got a lot of good ones here. So this case was done by Debbie House Wilson, who uh, uh, was a uh, Berkeley PhD in economics and, uh, in fact, uh, was my teaching assistant for two years. So I know Debbie uh, pretty well. And that's become, I think, an important case, and others are following that uh, case as well. Uh, Alan, if I yeah. could, I, I, um, at the risk of sounding like we're in violent agreement, um, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, the point I was trying to make earlier is there are mechanisms in place to deal with these kind of issues and address them, uh, as opposed to taking a broad sweeping public policy position that would stand in the way of seeing these things develop where, in fact, it is the right thing. If you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. If you've seen one local community, healthcare community market, you've seen one healthcare community market. And um, you need, there's a distinction between dealing with the individual case and the broader, the broader policy. Yeah, although we have published that, you know, particularly when it comes to physician practices, the hospitals, of course, are a much higher profile, but a, a lot of the consolidation uh, both horizontal and vertical around uh, physician practice is very small scale, doesn't get the attention of anyone until you're sort of further down the road than, than unraveling is an option. Uh, we are coming up on time and we do have to stop on time. I think I can fit a question, maybe two. I'll take one here and one back there and then I think we're going to probably have to close up for the morning. Sorry about, sorry I asked so many questions. Hello, Pamela Rosada, California Research Bureau. I heard, uh, first of all, thank you for working on this effort. I have herded cats before trying to get agencies to work together and I understand how difficult that can be, so I applaud your efforts. Um, whenever I hear the phrase uh, administrative savings, I applaud it, right? We want things more efficient, yet it almost always also equates to job losses. So if we thought about that aspect of this and what that might do to an already challenged job market. Who wants to talk about the fact that every uh, dollar into the healthcare system goes out into someone's pocket? Yeah, and uh, you're absolutely right. And in most, most communities in America, the hospital is the largest employer in that community. And uh, your observation is a correct one. There's not much more to say than that. And that is one of the considerations that needs to be recognized as we appropriately try to deal with this issue. Um, because it's not just the administrative system. Hospitals closing, which they have substantially, uh, or reduce their services, have an even bigger impact, frankly, than the administrative part, which is usually around 10% of the operating cost of a hospital. But when the whole hospital closes, then it changes. So there, there's a lot of pushes and pulls. I would say um, we need to uh, make sure that those administrative staff are well trained to work in an integrated delivery model, because that's the future. And uh, the hospital, uh, a lot of those people can be used in that delivery model, and hospitals can move to an integrated delivery model. So I don't think it's a threat to their job. I think they need to be repurposed 
and used another way in a system. I'm not advocating firing them, for sure not. I was trained as a labor economist, and I, I believe that it's important for people to have jobs. And so, but we need to, the management and the leadership needs to say, these people need to move away from hospital billing to working in an integrated delivery model because we're going to do better. If we do better, they're going to do better. If they're going to get higher wages and better job security. If we try to continue to do what we are now, the hospital is going to shrink and they're going to lose their jobs. So it's their responsibility now to move these people where they can be productively used. Yeah. No, it's, it's a super important issue. Um, but as Professor Scheffler points out, people need to adjust and maybe they can even get better wages. Um, but it's, it's a tough real life issue, like in the coal industry where people are losing their jobs, but the world is changing and we just need to retrain and make sure that we take care of those jobs and those people, but it may mean re retraining. Okay, our quick last round here before I let you all go. So it's Anne-Marie Marcharelli. I hope this mic is on. It's a question for you, Richard. When you talk about... Um, closer to... It's on, but a little closer. You, when you talk about the IOM report, which was very interesting, and the 30% attributed to duplicative waste and then administrative costs, it sounded when we're... The whole panel here was singing as a choir. It sounded like you were saying, so we need integrated uh, clinically and financial. Wouldn't that make insurance companies, health insurance companies obsolete? I think the question is, if every system is integrated, what's the role of the insurance company? Ah, well, I think, um, Steve, what's the role of the insurance company? <laughs> He doesn't want to answer that, but he knows what the role of the insurance company is because he's got, uh, I think, uh, 800,000 people in, uh, already in an integrated delivery system and growing rapidly and a bunch of staff developing that product line. So he sees the future. So the future is these insurance companies need to, are already transitioning, at least the smart ones, to this new delivery model. Sutter has an HMO. I could go on and on. University of California, so eventually uh, they will repurpose themselves and move into uh, uh, a capitated uh, delivery model. Uh, and, and it's done primarily, and though you promised me access to your negotiators, uh, at some point I'm going to come back and talk to you about that, how you do that, what's the secret sauce, but it is done through contracts. Uh, it's a contracting mechanism, and I think it, it works quite effectively. And, uh, and uh, that product, I think, has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of potential in California, and I think others uh, will start to look at it and pick up. I know the big investors are, are onto it already. No, I, uh, I think that uh, depending on how far and how fast the payment model moves to a payment model that supports um, uh, population health, uh, there's no doubt it would have an impact on the role of the commercial insurance uh, market and then it's a question of their ability to adapt. Okay, as uh, I know we could go longer, but we can't. So I want to, uh, first of all, thank California Healthcare Foundation, Blue Shield of California Foundation for the support of the issue and for this event. I'd ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. And if there's one thing everyone agrees upon, at least as much as that we should have integrated health systems, it's that seven minutes is not long enough to speak. <laughs> and I apologize for that, but I am grateful to all of you for uh, compressing your remarks. Um, it's a real privilege for us to be able to be here and have this conversation. I know it doesn't end here, but I hope we gave you a lot to work with. Uh, thank you very much, and we are adjourned.